started. So, um, as I mentioned, there are going to there aren't changes, uh, but there are some uh, clarifications that I want to make. Uh, the first is that I've decided uh, to stay consistent, uh, especially because it looks like we may be extended, we may not. We still have not gotten any new information that way, but. Uh, because I want to make sure you are active in this learning process, I've decided to assign uh, the interviews as they've been assigned, uh, but have the, you turn them in. You can either um, you know, take pictures of them and give me the pictures, or you can uh, scan them as PDFs and turn them in however that way, but the same way you turn in the Physio Xs, uh, there will be um, uh, drop points for them on our, um, on our, uh, in our modules of our Canvas site. And actually, I want to share that with you right now. So uh, let me go ahead and we'll talk more about this when we come back. But uh, let's go to that. Where is it? Oh, that's where it is. OK, hold on. Um, that. Perfect. All righty. So, there's a couple been a couple of changes to our uh, website on our module, so I want to make sure to point those out. Uh, the first here is a study area. I think we talked about this. I hope we talked about this. Uh, but uh, one of the things that can help you with your lab stuff is CRC has a visual anatomy lab. Uh, so if we click on this uh, link here, it takes us to our visual anatomy lab. This is where, as you see, you can see the lab materials like would be in the class. So if we oops, go down to the respiratory system, they have some great histology pictures here. And then they also have pictures of the respiratory models and chart. So there's our good half head chart that we have there. Uh, so those things are available for you that way. This is a great way to study this material. What's cool about this site is they have a picture like this with uh, no labels on it. So it gives you the opportunity to challenge yourself with it. But then if you click, it will actually show you all of the labels. So you can see all of the anatomy and all of the regions of the stuff that we've been talking about. Now, again, this is from CRC. They may have a slightly different lab manual. They may have a different emphasis. Uh, so some of the things that are here uh, are things you may not be responsible for, although by the looks of it, all of these are things you are. However, one thing I will point out is if you notice, they've got uh, that term uh, false vocal fold, and you know we're not using that. We are using vestibular fold. Uh, so that is something that is different. But again, as you look through this, oh, the perfect, there's that great picture where we were talking about uh, the cuneiform and corniculate cartilages that can be seen. So in there we can see that on that posterior view of the uh, uh, throat region. So again, this is a great resource. We talked about that. I've added that link to make it super easy to get to. All this, also this morning when I woke up, someone, uh, uh, one of the students, Carol, sent me a um, uh, a link to a Instagram story, a video story about a 3D rendering of uh, a lung that was uh, damaged by COVID-19, which I thought was interesting, so I added that there. If you have any other study tools or things that will be helpful, then I want you to take advantage of that and sh share those with me, and I will share that with the class as well. However, the other thing that I want to show you are the changes that have taken place down here in our section three for the respiratory system. As I mentioned, the same way that we have these drop boxes for the Physio X assignments, we now have a drop box for our unit reviews. So like I said, uh, you can scan them. If you're, if you're printing them, you can just, I mean, if you're uh, doing them on the computer, if you have the online lab manual, you can just fill it in and save it as a PDF. Fill it out, uh, uh, scan them, and turn it into a PDF if you want, if you have the paper copy. Or the other thing, <clears throat> which is probably easiest to do if you would like, you can just take pictures of them. Once you do that, take pictures of them, and then you can drop them in the Dropbox. Oh, and this is, I'm going to show you my view of it, the student view of it, because it's here. Uh, but uh, there will be a Dropbox just like the other ones uh, that we've seen. Um, here, and let's actually do this. Go back to the modules there. Hold on a second. Um, hold on a second.
All right, let's look at it this way. So again, we have those study tools there available for you at the top. When we come to a section and we go to like their unit 22 review, then as you can see, uh, you can submit the assignment. So again, it reminds you of what it is and you can submit the assignment here. And again, it can just be as a PDF, but it could also just be photos, whatever uh, works and is convenient for you. So you have that opportunity to do that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to get that back too. Excellent. The other thing that is in the modules, there's actually two things. There are the unit reviews, the physio X's, as you already know. But notice there is a control of respiration lab, the home lab. This is a lab, a wet lab we were going to do in class today, which uh, under correct conditions, you can actually complete at home. So what I have here for you in our lab handouts are the instructions. We'll go over this again at the end of the lecture today. But there are instructions here under the lab handouts, control of respiration, the home lab, uh, where the activities we were gonna be doing today, looking at how we control respiration are things that can be done at home. I will remind you when we go over it again later, but I will remind you again right now, these are not activities that you should be doing by yourself. Don't run out and find somebody off the street to do this with if you have, but if you have more uh, people in the household it, under the correct conditions being supervised, uh, this is an activity that can be done carefully at home. If you don't have all the resources for the whole thing, then I want you to do it as a thought experiment. I don't want you running to the store uh, to get red cabbage, for instance, just to be able to do this lab. Uh, but I think it's the opportunity to have some fun at home studying this material, uh, doing a lab type thing. Uh, the, yes, uh, the, uh, so hold on. So uh, it is something that we will uh, talk more about, but it is an opportunity where you guys can actually do some wet lab stuff at home. So that should hopefully be a good opportunity for you. Uh, let's, let me go back to the meeting real fast. Hold on. So if I stop sharing that. Uh, the meeting ID uh, here, and I will uh, share this with everyone just so you can pass this on. If you can't get in, it is 369-538-1671. Uh, so that is the meeting ID. <clears throat> if someone can't get in through Canvas, then you should be able to link correctly to it that way. So hopefully that will work. <clears throat> All righty. Excellent. So let's go back to our whiteboard. Hopefully my stuff is still there. Excellent. It is. So our game plan today is going to be to finish talking about our, um, I was going to be to finish talking about oops, hold on. the respiratory system, the third part, primarily the control of it and regulation, although we have some more physiology we have to talk about today. Like I said, we have a lab that you should be able to do uh, parts of it, and hopefully most of you should be able to do all of it at home. If not, like I said, I don't want you running into the store to buy the supplies you need for it. Instead, I want you to do it as a uh, thought experiment, what you think would happen and why it would happen. It's going to be very simple and straightforward, and we will go through that together. And then I wanted to remind you that now you are going to be turning in all of your assignments uh, and uh, the first three, all of the respiratory stuff is going to be due on Monday. So on Monday, we are going to start our discussion of the urinary system, switching to our second organ system for this one. Uh, but that means you have through the weekend to uh, complete all of the respiratory exercises if you have not done so already. Hopefully you've already been doing them as we've been studying them and going through them. Uh, but if not, um, that is the case. We then start the urinary system. Uh, we've got your unit uh, 25 due review, and then we go on spring break. I'm assuming we still have spring break. Again, we haven't been told otherwise. When we come back is when the rest of the urinary stuff is due. And then also, that also means on the 15th of March, I believe that is what the correct schedule is right now. And pardon me, of April. The 15th of April is when we will have our exam, whether it is on. Uh, in person or on campus, I don't know, but we will find out. So you need to start preparing for that as well. So as we get more information, uh, then I will pass that along, but that is the game plan. So any questions on that before we dive back into the lecture? Like I said, uh, questions on the lab, today's lab we'll talk about after the lecture. 
So uh, save those questions. But anything else about what's going on and what you're responsible for for the next uh, few days and this weekend? All right, excellent. With that then, let me check one thing real quick. Nope, didn't think so. All right, perfect. Then let us switch gears to our slide presentation and dive into lecture. So I need that back. I need that back. Perfect. All right. So I got all my stuff. Hopefully you got all your stuff and we are ready to go. All right. We left off last time and we were working our way through uh, pulmonary respiration. We had talked about the muscles involved, both the active and passive movement of those muscles. And um, we had finished things off by doing the respiratory volumes. I uh, talked about those, figured out how to calculate those, figured out how they relate to each other. And hopefully you did some of the physio -X stuff where you got to see those activities. I know we didn't get a chance to uh, breathe into the tubes ourselves, but uh, hopefully this was something that you got a chance to do. And again, remember we talked about uh, making sure we need to understand the definitions and the relationships of these things. The absolute numbers of these averages aren't as important as knowing how they relate to each other. That the inspiratory capacity is comprised of the tidal volume versus the inspiratory reserve volume. So those are the things we talked about last time. What we need to talk about now then is the other component of the respiratory system and that is our gas exchange. In particular, our external gas exchange. So let's steal some of the board here. Where's my annotation tools? Perfect. So it's been a little bit, so remind me again, external, when we talk about external gas exchange, there are two ways that we can think about it. We can think of this in terms as the structures. <clears throat> where the exchange takes place. And let's spread this out a little bit better. Or we can think of it in terms of the medium where the exchange takes place. All right. For external gas exchange, what are the structures that we are exchanging between? Uh, capillaries of the lungs and the alveoli. Yep. Do I not have my volume on? Hold on. Oh, my volume is not on. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. Now I think I can hear you. Can you try that again? The capillaries of the lungs and the alveoli. Excellent. So definitely the alveoli. However, we have to be careful. Remember, one of the things we finished talking about in the last class is we have more than one type of capillary in the lung because of that bronchial circulation as well as the pulmonary circulation, we have both pulmonary capillaries and systemic capillaries. And which of those two capillaries are the ones we're gonna exchange here with external gas exchange? Systemic. Pulmonary. pulmonary. This is between the outside world, absolutely. Alveoli and pulmonary capillaries. Oops, I don't think I spelled that right at all. Uh, one P, two L's, that looks better. Excellent, and pulmonary capillaries, excellent. Whereas uh, the mediums would be what? Air and blood. There you go, air in the alveoli and blood in, let's spread those out a little bit more, and blood in the pulmonary capillaries. And of course, with the external gas exchange, when we talked about uh, the gases involved, of course, the gases involved are going to be oxygen and carbon dioxide. And in this case, and again, well, actually, let's move this to the center because we can think of it in either way. Oxygen goes which way, from alveoli to pulmonary capillaries or from air to blood? I mean, from alveoli to pulmonary capillaries or pulmonary capillaries, actually, let's keep this over here. Alveoli to pulmonary capillaries or pulmonary capillaries to alveoli? Pulmonary to alveoli? Uh, the oxygen's gonna go from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. 
There you go. So it's going to go into the pulmonary capillaries. Or again, and it might sometimes be easier to think of it this way, we'd think of it in terms of the mediums. If we think of it in terms of the mediums, that oxygen uh, is going to go into the blood. All right? That, and then, of course, CO2 does the opposite. Let's just do that this way. Uh, CO2 goes into the air, or again, carbon dioxide goes into the alveoli. Oops. All righty, excellent. So that is our external gas exchange that we talked about. And then of course, essentially, internal gas exchange is similar. Where again, we have structures for exchange. Or mediums. Oops. Or exchange. This time in internal gas exchange, the structures are going to be uh, the tissues. And in this case, the systemic capillaries. And of course, the mediums now are interstitial fluid and the blood. Notice the one thing is that is consistent between these are the blood. So one of the things that is sometimes helpful and consistent to think of it is to think of it in terms of the blood. Here, oxygen goes into the blood or uh, what we could say, we say CO2 goes into the air or what we could also have set up here is CO2 goes out of the blood. Right, so we could have said that as well. And the same thing is true here. We can think of these gases, it's gonna be those same gases. It's gonna be oxygen and it's gonna be CO2. Uh, however, here with internal gas exchange, it is the oxygen that goes out of the blood. And it is the carbon dioxide that goes into the blood. So notice if we think of it in terms of blood, because the structures are slightly different, uh, the mediums can be slightly different, but the one consistent in these gas exchanges is the blood. So with external gas exchange, oxygen goes into the blood. With internal gas exchange, oxygen goes out of the blood. With external gas exchange, CO2 goes out of the blood. With internal gas exchange, CO2 goes into the blood. So again, any way of describing these things, oxygen going uh, into the capillary uh, or going out of the capillary, going into the tissues, out of the tissues, into the OVLI, out of the OVLI, right? The one thing we wanna make sure when you're describing this is that you're not just saying in or out. You need to be specific. What is it going into? What is it going out of? Provide a structure, provide a medium when you're describing the movements of these. Don't just say out or in because that isn't interpretable. Because again, it's gonna depend on what it is. So make sure you're describing those things. Now we've got a lot of pretty words here showing this, but you know me, I like my pretty pictures. So notice here we have a pretty picture that represents our external gas exchange. Notice we have our carbon dioxide leaving a pulmonary capillary and going into the alveolus, so out of the blood into the air. Oxygen is leaving the air in the alveolus to go into the blood of the pulmonary uh, circulation. And of course, what happens to it when it gets in there and how we get that CO2 out is something we'll talk about today. But right now we're just talking about the movements that are taking place. And here we have the pretty picture from your textbook showing our internal gas exchange. Notice in this case, CO2 goes out of the tissue, out of the interstitial fluid, into the systemic capillary, into the blood. Oxygen goes out of the blood, into, uh, out of the blood of the systemic capillary, 
into the interstitial fluid of the tissue. So here we have those pretty pictures that show that process that we just finished writing uh, on, well, I guess it's not the board, but writing on the whiteboard. All right, questions on that? All right, now, as we talked about, one of the important things to remember is that both this external gas exchange and this internal gas exchange is a passive process. And what is the big, huge, significant thing about that being a passive process? No ATP. It is not using ATP, absolutely. And if we're not going to use ATP, then what we need to do is try to maximize the efficiency of this. We've talked about some of the ways that we're going to do that. We have millions of alveoli, so we have a huge surface area. We know that this respiratory membrane is two simple squamous epithelial tissues and a little bit of basement membrane or basal lamina between them. So we know that is going to be the case. Uh, but, and, and we've talked about other things as well, like we're warming it and things along those lines. But the other thing we need to appreciate and understand is that, well, let's go back here. When we talk about gases moving, gases move, and let me go ahead and write this here. They move down a pressure gradient. This is not a new concept for us. When we talked about a diffusion way back in 430, we know that solutes move down a concentration gradient. So if I have a beaker, and on one side of that beaker is 80% glucose, and on the other side is 30% glucose, and we poke holes in that uh, diaphragm, separate them, we know that the glucose is gonna move from the 80% to the 30% until it reaches equilibrium. And that equilibrium point, as we talked about, would be halfway in between in that case, halfway in between 80 and 30 would be 55, All right? So it is that pressure, uh, pardon me, that concentration gradient that causes these things to move. And it's the same thing with gases. Gases are going to move from a location of a high pressure to a location of a low pressure. What that means is to understand how the gases move, we need to understand the pressures of those gases as they're dissolved in fluids. And to do that, thankfully, we need more physics. As I've said many, 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 many times, uh, chemistry is completely pointless. Nothing ever good has come from chemistry. It's a stupid science and should never even be followed or studied. However, physics is awesome. Uh, so what we need to do is spend some time talking some more physics. We've already talked about one physics law. What was the other physics law we just finished learning about in the last class? Boyle's law. Boyle's law, absolutely. That relationship between volume and pressure. And since pressure makes the world go round, Boyle is, is super, super important. Our next uh, law we need to know, physics law, is Dalton's law. Dalton's law basically says a gas in a mixture exerts its own pressure. Again, this is something that's a little bit easier to demonstrate when we're in the classroom, because as we've talked about, when we talk about the pressures of gases, I keep using the examples of blindfolding you guys and letting you guys roam around the room. And as you bump into the walls, I count the number of times you bump in the walls, and that is our pressure. Now, as you guys are walking around blindfolded, bumping into the walls, I have two types of people in the classroom. I have boy type people and I have girl type people. And does how many times the boy type people bounce into the wall, does that affect how many times the girl type people bounce into the walls? No, it no. doesn't. Yeah, exactly. No. So basically, the boys and the girls each have their own pressure. Yes, together, if boys bounce into the walls five times and girls bounce into the walls five times, although that's not likely what's going to happen because we have more girls in the class. So let's say the boys bounce into the wall three times and the girls bounce into the wall seven times. That would mean our pressure would be 10, but uh, that pressure is, the, is caused by the adding of the girl's pressure and the boy's pressure together. One person doesn't affect another person, the same way one gas doesn't affect another gas. So basically what this says, what Dalton's Law says is, let me go ahead and type this up here, I'll sneak it into the top. A gas, this pressure, is basically the sum of all the individual pressures together. Okay. 
and I should go back and say a mixed gases pressure. is the sum of all the individual pressures of the individual gases that are together. That's basically what he said. A gas in a mixture exerts its own pressure. Now, of course, the gas we care about is the air that surrounds us, and the air that surrounds us is a mixture. In fact, it is a mixture. Where is my next slide? That's weird. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Um, yes. Slide, yes. Um, my uh, slide seems to have, now my Zoom control has stopped. This isn't good. So, but you guys can still hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. I can't seem to control my Zoom anymore. Okay, hold on. That's back. I can, no, it's not back either. We always seem to find the fun things. Last time my uh, iPad thing wouldn't work and still wouldn't work. Now I can't seem to get this to All right, there you go. I got that sharing to stop. That is now working, excellent. All right, let's try this one more time. All right, we can see that, I can see that. See, I was, every time I start feeling comfortable and confident with this stuff, something screws me up. I was so excited last night when I figured out, I was actually in bed falling asleep when I realized that I could convert today's lab into something you guys could do at home. And so I got up and spent an hour in the middle of the night last night rewriting the lab so you guys could do it. And so I was all super happy and confident and excited. And then, uh, of course, things go wrong. Excellent. All right. So, Dalton's Law. A gas is basically, the pressure of a gas is made up of the individual gases. And the gas this we care about is air. Air is basically comprised of four main gases. Nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, water vapor, and carbon dioxide gas. So if we want to understand all of the individual pressures of gas, and let's remind ourselves, what is gases? So if we're talking about the air, and again, we are going to assume that we are where we are here at sea level. What is our air pressure? What is the pressure of the air around us? One atmosphere. True, one atmosphere, although that isn't necessarily as meaningful a number if we're going to do math. What's a more meaningful number if we're going to do math? You're absolutely correct. It is indeed one atmosphere. But if we don't want to work with percentages, and nobody likes percentages, what's another useful number we can use? 760 millimeters of mercury. There you go. 760 millimeters of mercury. Excellent. So that is our pressure of our air. We know the air is comprised of four different gases, and each of those gases is going to exert its own pressure. What that means is we can actually calculate the pressures of the individual gases. All right, so for oxygen, for instance, well, let's go with nitrogen. Nitrogen, actually, nitrogen first, how would we calculate that? 760 times 0.79. There you go, it's 79% of 760. So the way you do that is take 760, you, know, you multiply that times 0.79, and only if someone had 
a smart device in their pocket or in their hand that they could do that calculation, what would we come up with? Come on, don't make me do it. You guys got phones. 600.4. 600.4. Perfect, excellent, right? But let's talk about some gases we care more about. We keep talking about oxygen and CO2. So let's do the calculations for those. For oxygen, of course, it would be 760, in this case, times 21%, which would be 0.21. And what would that equal? 159.6 millimeters of mercury. There you go, and we'll round that up to 160 because it's a nice pretty number. And hopefully you guys can see where this is going. CO2 would be 760 times uh, 0.0004, because it makes a 0.04%. And what does that equal? 3.04. Come 3.04? 3.04. 3.04. Yeah. Point zero 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 four times seven sixty is point three zero four. Point three zero four. There you go. Zero point three zero four meters of mercury. Excellent. So we can do these calculations. We can figure all of this out and actually know the individual pressures. And while it's fun to calculate nitrogen, it's not as important. So let's go ahead and although notice as we add these up, six hundred seven sixty, right? That's our seven sixty right there. CO2, very little, water, very little uh, that we have of that. So it's mostly these two gases, but we can actually calculate the individual. And these two numbers in particular, you will need to memorize, or at least know how to calculate them, because these are gonna be important numbers, all right? I need to delete this, so make sure you understand that and know how we did that uh, so that we can do that. But let's go ahead and switch now. Um, and uh, go back to the slide. So again, if we wanna know the total pressure, we just have to add up the partial pressures and we did that math. So to determine the partial pressure of oxygen, like we did, we multiply the total pressure by oxygen. And as we said, we get 160 millimeters of mercury. So oxygen in the air that surrounds you has a partial pressure of 160 millimeters per mercury. However, remember as we talked about, this only works at sea level, because at sea level, the partial pressure, uh, pardon me, the, the pressure, atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, right? When you go up to Tahoe for the weekend, back in ancient times, we'd go up to Tahoe for the weekend, uh, and you could, you know, just gamble or ski or see people or be outside your house or do things along those lines. Notice that the partial pressure of oxygen is much lower up there. That's why when you get home with your three bags of groceries, you have no problem walking up the two flights of stairs to get to your apartment to put those things away. But when you go up to Tahoe for the weekend, just walking up the 12 steps to get into the casino, you're exhausted, right? That's why in the casino, you feel great because they're pumping in all that extra oxygen. But when you're outside, uh, the atmospheric pressure is much less. And so the partial pressure of oxygen is much less. And as it turns out, 110 is still enough for us to be able to meet our needs. But what if instead of going up to the top of Tahoe for the weekend, you go up to the top of Mount Everest? Or you're flying on that airplane across to, over to New York for spring break because, yeah, sure, everybody there is being quarantined and it's a big deal, but the flights are super cheap right now. So there you are at 50,000 feet in your airplane, but it's a little stifling in there, so you roll down a window. Is that something you're necessarily going to want to do? No, because look, at 50,000 feet, the partial pressure of oxygen in the air is 18. And that isn't going to be enough to keep you alive. So that's why they have those oxygen masks that'll come down. That's why people who climb Mount Everest typically have to do it with some type of oxygen assistance, oxygen tanks and things along those lines, because the amount of oxygen that is available up there in the air that you breathe in is incredibly diminished compared to what it is down here at sea level. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Now, this tells us something really important. Oxygen and CO2, we now know what the partial pressures of them are in our environment, and that's gonna help us in determining how oxygen and, and carbon dioxide diffuse across the lungs. 
But there is another part of this as well. As we just finished talking about, uh, over 600 millimeters of mercury of the pressure that is on us is nitrogen. So why aren't we more concerned about nitrogen and how nitrogen affects us? If there's a massive pressure of nitrogen, why isn't it getting into our blood and affecting us? Well, the reason for that is our third physics law. Third physics law is Henry's law. Henry's law basically talks about how much of a gas will dissolve in a liquid. As I mentioned, uh, for gas exchange to take place, the oxygen and the CO2 have to dissolve in water. That's why our respiratory conducting zone moistens it. We add moisture to those gases so that the gases can dissolve in that water, and when dissolved in that water, they are then able to diffuse across our respiratory membrane. And that's also why nitrogen isn't as much of an issue. It's because of Henry's law. Henry Law basically states that there are two things that determines how much of a gas can get into solution. The first of them is the partial pressure of the gas, and we'll come back to that in a second. But let's go ahead and use, let's go ahead and do a simple drawing here. Here we have <clears throat> A cup of water. All right. As we just finished talking about, we know nitrogen has a massive partial pressure. So let's actually do it this way. The partial pressure of nitrogen, as we talked about, equals 600 millimeters of mercury. So if you think about it, there is a massive pressure of nitrogen on water to try to get into water. Right, much greater than the partial pressure of oxygen or the partial pressure of CO2. So why are we getting massive amounts of nitrogen in our blood? The reason for that is the second part of Henry's law, and that is the solubility of a gas. Each gas inherently has its own solubility, how easily it dissolves in water. And nitrogen dissolves in water about as well as, oh, I don't know, something like uh, lipids, you know, like olive oil. How well does olive oil dissolve into water? Not at all. Yeah, not at all. And nitrogen is the same way. While there is a massive pressure on nitrogen, it has an incredibly low, very low solubility. And because of that, almost no uh, nitrogen gets into our blood under normal conditions. However, and oh, oh I, I can do it. <laughs> By a quick show of hands on your participation, how many people here have ever scuba dived before? Anyone? Excellent, a couple, oh, a fair number of you. Excellent, excellent. So when you scuba dive, unless you're doing really super deep sea uh, scuba diving, uh, typically what they do is they take the air in the environment around you, and they take that air that's sitting right next to you right now, and they cram it into a tank. Once they cram that into the tank, uh, then what they do is they strap that tank onto your back so that you are able to go underwater and you can breathe the air. As we go underwater, uh, the pressure of the water around us dramatically increases as the further down you go. I think it's like uh, some crazy number. I don't remember the exact math of it, but I think for every like uh, 10 meters you go down, the pressure doubles or something crazy like that. It is a very, very uh, rapidly ascending pressure as you go under the water. What can happen when you are scuba diving for a long period of time, that increase of pressure, as we have more and more pressure going on from that depth, we get a more and more and more increase of pressure on that nitrogen. And even though it has a very low solubility, eventually what will start to happen if some of that nitrogen will actually be forced into your blood. If you're down there for a long period of time, this can cause a condition they call nitrogen necrosis, where basically that nitrogen, as it gets into your blood from that increased pressure, uh, gives you almost a drunk-like, a euphoric kind of uh, lightheaded type of sensation that can come from that for being down there for a long period of time. Again, can occur. The other way that it is an issue is when you ascend. 
as you start coming back out of the water and ascending in the water and the pressure starts to drop, that nitrogen is gonna come out of solution. As long as you ascend slowly enough, then what actually happens is you have the opportunity for that nitrogen to get to the lungs before it is released and exposed. However, if you ascend very, very rapidly, then what happens is those nitrogen bubbles can actually form and come out inside of your blood vessels. Right? Uh, we call that a decompression sickness, or what is the common term that they use for that condition? The bends. The bends. bends. There you go, the bends because it bends you over in pain, right? That decompression sickness is caused by those bubbles coming out of solution early, right? So that's really the key to Henry's law. Henry's law is that yes, a gas has an inherent solubility that cannot be changed. Oxygen is high, carbon dioxide is high, nitrogen is very, very low. However, what can change is the partial pressure of a gas. We absolutely can change the partial pressure. Like I said, about you know a handful of you uh, that are here right now at least admitted to scuba diving, but how many people here have had a can of soda before? Apparently none of you. You're all health conscious. One person. There you go. Uh, excellent. All right. So a lot of you, a lot more people have had a can of soda than have had uh, necessarily been scuba diving, but it's the exact same type of thing. And again, it's even better with a, uh, here, let me go ahead and clear this. It is even better if it is a bottle of soda, right? I'll go ahead and cheat and draw my can. But again, cans aren't clear, uh, so uh, it's not as efficient. But if you have that bottle, if you, you know, have a bottle of soda at home, when you look at that bottle and you look inside, the uh, solution inside is completely clear, right? So you have that Mountain Dew and you see this nice, clear, smooth, uh, um, consistent uniform green coloration to it. Then you pop the cap, you take the top off of it. And when you take the top off of it, suddenly all these bubbles start to appear. I know none of those are circles, but you get the idea. The reason those bubbles appear is because what happened when they canned that is they took carbon dioxide a massive amount of carbon dioxide, and they forced it into the can. In fact, the partial pressure uh, in that can is something close to, I think it's something close to like, I don't know, um, let's, let's lie and make a number, 100 millimeters of mercury. I don't think it's quite that high, I think it's closer to 40, but again, we'll exaggerate the point there. We have a huge, massive partial pressure of carbon dioxide that they forced into that solution because they've increased the pressure on it. They basically pressurized it when they canned it or when they bottled it. However, when you then open it up, you open it up to the outside world. And when it's open up to the outside world and the pressure now here is just one atmosphere, the pressure out here is now 760 millimeters of mercury. Oops. That allows that carbon dioxide to come out of solution. And it comes out of solution because of the partial pressures. What did we say the partial pressure of carbon dioxide was out here in the outside world? 0 0.304. 0 0.304, excellent, All right? Basically nothing. Inside the can, it's 100. So what happens is carbon dioxide wants to move down its pressure gradient, wants to leave the solution and be able to come out. By changing the partial pressure, by no longer pressurizing this, we allow that gas to come out of solution. All right, we comfortable with that idea? Sure. Excellent. Now, here's the last thing too that I wanna make sure remember when we emphasize. When we talk about our, and I'll go ahead and cheat and draw it again. There's my beaker. And in my beaker, I have right, a membrane. And again, let's go with those numbers we had before. 80% on one side, 30% on the other side. And if I poked holes through this, 
then we know that our glucose would move from the left to the right until it reached equilibrium. And as we talked about, that point of equilibrium would be 55% on this side and 55% on that side. All right, everybody comfortable with that? Not a new concept here. Everybody, hopefully that makes sense. Excellent, perfect. Right, now let's think about what happens here when you open that soda while you're drinking your caffeine while I'm giving this lecture. The partial pressure in your room is 0 0.34 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure in your can of soda, like I said, is closer to 40, but we'll use 100 because that's a simple, uh, easy number. Does that mean that all the carbon dioxide is going to come out until the carbon dioxide in your room and in your soda is now 50 millimeters of mercury inside of your soda? And then also in your room, it is 50 millimeters of mercury. Is that what's going to happen? No. No. And the reason for that is where here over in our, let me move that over here a little bit more. Um, in our beaker, we have the same volume of water in both of these locations. And so when we have the same value of water in both of these locations, then equilibrium is going to be halfway in between. If you think of how much volume you're is, you have in a single can of soda versus how much volume of air you have in the room around you, right? then basically what that means is that, not, that you don't have the same volume of stuff here. It's still going to reach a point of equilibrium, but basically what will happen in this situation is that the gas is going to continue to come out of our soda and it's gonna to continue to come out of our soda. But as it comes out of our soda, is it really gonna change the partial pressure of CO2 in the room around us? No. Yeah, if you, if you were sitting there in your chair, and don't do this, but again, if we did it as a thought experiment, if we were sitting here in your chair and you lit a match, and you let that match burn, is that gonna change the temperature of the room that you're in, one single match? No. no, you're not going to be able to change the temperature. And the same thing here. The carbon dioxide is going to continue to come out of this can into the environment of the outside world, but it's not going to be able to change the partial pressure of the outside world. So eventually what will happen is that the partial pressure of CO2 in this can will eventually become equal to the air around us, 0 0.304, at which point we no longer see any um, at which point we no longer see any bubbles inside of our soda. And what do we typically consider our soda has done? Oops, what did I accidentally erase there? One. There we go. All right, we no longer see any bubbles in our soda. And what do we consider our soda at that point? Flat. Yeah, that it's gone flat. Absolutely. Oh, I guess I can't undo that. All right, we'll leave one more bubble just so I can have that. Excellent. Exactly. It's gone flat. And that's basically what's happened. At this point, it is now equalized. It's now at equilibrium, but it's at equilibrium because the volumes are not the same. So that gas is going to continue to come out until it's equal to the room, at which point it's flat. So that's the other important concept of Henry's law. It is the partial pressure of gases that are going to determine um, how it moves and we can modify that. And then obviously the solubility has an effect as well. Now, I've done this all with my little cute little drawings. Let's go through this uh, with the pictures from your book. Again, here's what happens with that soda. We, they take that soda, they put carbon dioxide gas into that soda can, and then they pressurize it. And when they pressurize it, basically they're forcing that carbon dioxide into solution. So they're basically supersaturating it by increasing the partial pressure. By increasing the partial pressure, they can get more carbon dioxide into that can. And so now we have our carbonated beverage. All right, and there's our carbonated beverage with all that CO2 forced into the solution. You pop the top on it, and now you expose it to the outside world. And now that gas can leave, the pressure decreases, and now 
all of that carbon dioxide comes out of solution. We have that nice bubbly soda pop. As the carbon dioxide leaves, because it's trying to reach equilibrium, it keeps adding more and more carbon dioxide to the outside world, but it's not going to be able to change it. So it just keeps going out and out and out till eventually the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in your soda is equal to the carbon dioxide uh, partial pressure of your environment, which is less than one millimeter of mercury, which means our soda is now flat. All right. We've talked about these already, but, oh, well, some of these already, so let's talk about the first ones. We already just talked about how when you're scuba diving, one of the implications, clinical implications of Henry's law is that nitrogen narcosis, as we talked about, when you're under pressure underwater, uh, they use that canned environmental air, and so that has a tremendous amount of uh, nitrogen in it. That's why if you go deep sea scuba diving, they don't just can the air around you. They actually make a special mixture of air that actually has more oxygen, uh, more water moisture in it, and less nitrogen in it, so that it, lim it decreases the amount of nitrogen necrosis that you get. If you're just doing it, you know, like at, you know, down in Monterey Bay or something like that, like I said, they're just canning the air around you. But if you're going deep or prolonged scuba diving, they actually change the mixture of the tanks to help to limit that nitrogen necrosis that occurs. We talked about that bends, the implication of that. Then if you come up too quickly, the nitrogen can come out of solution. But there are positive things for this as well. A hyperbaric chamber, right? If you are exposed to carbon monoxide, as we talked about carbon monoxide, uh, competes for oxygen at its binding site uh, on the red blood cells, and I mean the hemoglobin. And so one of the ways we can get that is put you in an oxygen-rich environment, dramatically increase the pressure, and we can force more oxygen into the blood. And as we force more oxygen into the blood, that can help to outcompete the carbon monoxide and get that out. Uh, if you are, again, it's no longer, uh, but if you are the king of pop, Right, one of the things that, and again, in this game, I mean music, not the soda. Um, Michael Jackson allegedly uh, slept in a hyperbaric chamber, uh, giving him the opportunity. Oh, this is the first time I get to make this a reference. Uh, giving him the opportunity to um, hopefully he thought heal better by getting more oxygen saturation into it. And a lot of professional athletes. Uh, this is usually when I would make the joke about how if you uh, you know uh, cheated on your wife in Denver and then a tore a ligament in your knee, one of the things that you would do is go to Europe uh, to basically uh, get treatment. And one of those things that, again, but since Kobe died, I can't make that joke anymore, it's now tasteless. But one of the things that Kobe Bryant, when he was trying to recover from his knee injury would do is he went to Europe to get some treatments. And one of the treatments that they were doing was putting him in a hyperbaric chamber. And after he did it, a lot of athletes started doing it as well. Because by being in that hyperbaric chamber, you get more oxygen into the blood. And as we talked about, oxygen plays an important role in the repair, uh, providing the oxygen and the metabolism necessary for lots of ATP to help in the repair of injuries. So there are a lot of uh, athletes now who take advantage of these hyperbaric chambers to be able to uh, heal uh, more readily from uh, these injuries that they have. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Um, so lastly, the factors that affect the uh, uh, efficiency of gas exchange, as we talked about, we wanna have big partial pressures because it is a passive process. We want that thin respiratory membrane. We want that huge surface area. So we've already talked about these things and now we know how to get the partial pressures and what these partial pressures mean. So what we need to do next is be able to calculate it. What we're gonna do next, and again, of course, gases have to be in the liquid, uh, in water to be able to diffuse. What we're gonna do next is go through our circulatory system, both our systemic and our pulmonary, and talk about the movement and the changes of gases as it goes through there. This uh, is a lot of numbers, and these are numbers you are absolutely positively responsible for. So what we'll do is we'll start on this slide here, but I think uh, this is a good point to go ahead and take our first break. So any questions before we take our first break? Any questions on any of these physics laws? Uh, we now have three. 
Boyles, Daltons, and Henrys. Know those laws, know why they're important. Definitely testable type of material. Any questions on any of that? All right, so now we're gonna put uh, these laws into uh, use by talking about uh, these gas and the, the gas values that and so we can actually see how that exchange is going to take place. But like I said, let's go ahead and take our first break first. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a 10 minute break. Uh, like I promised, we'll do them a little bit longer. My watch says uh, 8.57, so that means let's come back at 9.07. And at 9.07, we will start. And I'll remind myself to start the recording as well. All right, I am going to pause the recording. We'll take a quick 10 minute break and then come back and pick up the lecture from here. All righty, excellent. So now we know how to get the partial pressures. We understand the relationship of these partial pressures and why they're important. So now what we're gonna go through is learn the partial pressures at all the different locations and how they change, which is gonna help us to understand how internal and external gas exchange takes place. All right, so any questions before we get started on this? All right, excellent. So let's get our two starting points. Our first starting point, as we of course know, is out here in the atmosphere, in our environment. So out here in the world, our atmospheric air, uh, oops, should I spell air right? We know, of course, the partial pressure, uh, partial pressure of oxygen, as we calculated, is equal to 160 millimeters of mercury. And we know that the partial pressure of CO2 uh, equals 0 0.304 millimeters of mercury. And let's do that and that so that we can put this up here in the corner out of our way. Excellent. So we know that is the starting point of the partial pressures of the air in the environment that around surrounds us. All right. Notice here, we also have uh, the partial pressures of oxygen and CO2 in our blood. Starting here, and let's go to the highlighter here to highlight this. Starting here, as it leaves our systemic capillary, the partial pressure of oxygen in our blood is 40 millimeters of mercury, and the partial pressure of CO2 is 45 millimeters of mercury. Right? Notice one of the important factors about this, one of the things that I like to get on my soapbox, that I like to get up on my high horse about, is that these blue blood vessels are not deoxygenated blood. A partial pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury is still a decent amount of oxygen. Not enough for you to survive on, of course, but it does have oxygen in it. So deoxygenated blood is not an appropriate term. And again, I'm, I got my high horse again, but that's all right, I don't care. So it is definitely oxygen poor. Now, remember these blood vessels as we talked about are capillaries. So as it leaves, I mean our conduits. So as it leaves our tissues and goes back to the whore, that horse, goes back to the heart, and as it leaves the heart to go to the lungs in that pulmonary artery, going to the pulmonary capillary, do we expect there to be any change in these partial pressures? No. No, so there is no change. So basically the blood that enters the pulmonary capillary, I'm gonna abbreviate these things, we have the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be equal to 40. And I'm not gonna keep writing millimeters of mercury so that I have more space. And the partial pressure, let's do this, partial pressure of a CO2, is equal to 45. Uh, so there and there, excellent. So when the blood enters the pulmonary capillary, partial pressure of oxygen is at 40 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of CO2 is 45 millimeters of mercury. 
Now, when it enters that pulmonary capillary right here, it is going to exchange with the uh, air in the alveolus. And because we know and understand partial pressure oxygen equals partial pressure CO2 equals, let's try to line these things up a little bit so that they're gonna be nice and pretty. Now, uh, as we know in our alveolus, because this is getting the air from the outside world, what is the partial pressure of oxygen going to be? 760. Well, just partial pressure of oxygen. 600. Partial pressure of oxygen. 160. Excellent. Partial pressure of CO2? 0.304. Excellent, exactly. So the partial pressure of oxygen is 104 millimeters of mercury and the partial pressure of CO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury, just like we said. Wait, what? That's not what we said at all. What the heck is going on? Why aren't those numbers the same as in the outside, in the outside world? The change in the diameter of the arteries? Not a bad guess, though. That's a good guess. And, and, and it is something about that. But again, what this goes back to is a little about what we were talking about before. Is it because they've been moisturized? So they have more ability to solute in the water? Not a bad guess as well. But notice this value is much, much lower than this value. So that might work for carbon dioxide but it wouldn't work for oxygen. No, what's actually happening is remember, this is the atmospheric air. However, while you are sitting here, and let me change the color of my pen to emphasize this. While you are, no, I don't want the red, because red, too much implications, we'll use brown. While we are sitting here resting in your uh, seat, listening to this lecture, you are taking in a tidal volume of air, right? And how much of that tidal volume of air did we say that was on average? 500 milliliters. Yeah, 500 milliliters. And again, I, I, I know in fairness, I told you you didn't have to memorize that. But again, it's not a bad thing to know. When you take in that 500 milliliters of air, is that the only air that is in your lungs? Nope. No. 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 Exactly. Remember, when you take that tidal volume, you still have an aspiratory reserve volume of air that is in your lungs. And you have the residual volume that are in the lungs. So these are already in the lungs. So really, what you're doing is adding 500 milliliters to the gas that's already there. And remind me again, uh, again, I know this isn't fair because I told you you didn't have to memorize these numbers, but anybody, can anybody look back and tell me what the expiratory reserve volume and the, and the uh, reserve volumes were? 1,200 for each. Yeah, 1,200 for each, excellent. So notice there is already 2,400 milliliters of air in the lungs already that we are adding air to. In fact, if you remember correctly, this is what we called our functional reserve capacity. This was the air that could be participating in gas exchange. And since it is participating in gas exchange, it is already given oxygen and taken on CO2. And since it's already taken on ox given off oxygen and taken on CO2, it is, has a lower amount of oxygen, it has a higher amount of CO2, and so we're mixing this really oxygen-rich blood and C, I mean, pardon me, oxygen-rich air and CO2-poor air to it, but it's still, we're only adding 500 milliliters to 2,400 milliliters. We're not going to be able to bring it exactly to atmospheric. Now, if we completely emptied the lungs and completely filled it with atmospheric air, then that's what the values would be. But because what we're really doing when we breathe in, when we breathe in, what we're really doing is mixing air. And when we mix the air, these are the values that we get as a result of this. As a result of this, the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus 
is 104 millimeters of mercury, and the partial pressure of CO2 in the LVLS is 40. Does that part make sense? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. So now what is going to happen is we are going to get our gas exchange that is going to take place. Uh, go here, go here. And let's just abbreviate. External gas exchange takes place. And with that external gas exchange, which way does oxygen move? Into the blood. Into the blood. Oxygen is going to move into the blood. Which way is carbon dioxide going to move? Out of the blood. Out of the blood. And it's going to do this till it reaches equilibrium. Now again, what, like we talked about before, what we have here is an issue of soda cans and rooms. Which are the alveolus and the blood capillaries equal in size? No. Remember the capillaries are one blood vessel in diameter thin. They are tiny. Our alveoli are the big, huge rooms. So just like when we open that can of soda in the room, the gas concentrations in that soda change to the room, the same thing is gonna happen here. When the blood leaves, and let's go ahead and write that over here. As the blood leaves uh, the pulmonary capillary, we are going to have changes in the partial pressure of oxygen and in the partial pressure of CO2. And what do you think the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be when it leaves the pulmonary capillary after the exchange of gases has taken place? Oxygen is gonna enter into the blood and it's gonna keep entering into the blood until it reaches equilibrium. And remember, equilibrium is gonna be equal to what it is in the alveolus. So when it leaves the pulmonary capillary, its partial pressure is 104 millimeters of mercury. Because basically it loads up until it is equal to the environment that it is surrounded by. All right. And now that we know that, can you guess what the partial pressure of CO2 is gonna be when it leaves? 40. 40. There you go, it's gonna be 40. Uh, we are going to exhale. Well, not exhale, we are going to have CO2 move out of the blood into the air uh, until it reaches equilibrium. And at that point, it will be 40 millimeters of mercury. So during our gas exchange, the blood loaded up on oxygen. It is now oxygen rich and it has gotten rid of CO2 and is CO2 poor. And that brings us back to the whole CO2, uh, rich CO2 poor. Notice the changes in CO2 are not that significant. The change from 45 to 40 isn't that big of a deal. Where a change from 40 to 104 is a much bigger deal. We have much higher fluctuations in our oxygen levels than we have in our CO2 levels. All right, so these weird numbers made sense. We now understand how the external gas exchange took place and now our blood is leaving oxygen rich and with less CO2 than it had coming in. Are we comfortable with that? Yes. Excellent. So now, as we know, our blood vessels are conduits. So when it gets the blood reaches the heart, we're of course going to have a partial pressure of oxygen and a partial pressure of CO2. And because our blood vessels are just conduits, are there going to be any changes in the numbers from when they left? Uh, what's our partial pressure of oxygen going to be? 104. And what's our partial pressure of CO2 going to be? 40. Excellent, right? 40 and 100. Perfect. Excellent. Questions on that? Where'd the four go? Oh, yeah, look at that. How weird. It's 100 now instead of 104. What happened? Was that a typo for me? I certainly have plenty of them, but it's not a typo. The oxygen level of the blood is actually a little bit lower when it reaches the heart 
than it was when it left the pulmonary capillary. And why the heck is that? Anyone want to hazard a guess? I know. Anybody else figured out? Is it diffuse into the plasma, maybe? Not a bad guess. We, there definitely can be some diffusion, but really these blood vessels really are conduits. That isn't the problem. The problem is this. Uh, let's pick, that's a good color. Something happens to this blood on its way back to the heart. And that something that happens to the blood on the way back to the heart is our bronchial circulation. If you remember what we talked about, there are systemic blood vessels that carry blood to the lungs, bringing oxygen-rich systemic blood to the lungs to provide oxygen and nutrients to the tissues of the lungs that aren't the alveoli. And if you remember, do those bronchial veins go back to the right atrium of the heart? No. They're no. Now, remember, we talked about how the bronchial veins feed oxygen poor blood into the pulmonary capillary, I mean, into the pulmonary veins. And so what happens is those, that bronchial circulation, that pulmonary veins feed oxygen poor blood into our pulmonary veins. And as a result of that, the, and let's highlight that, as a result of this little bit of oxygen poor blood being added to that pulmonary vein, the partial pressure of oxygen drops as a result of that. So it's just we're mixing a little bit of oxygen poor blood into it, and that changes the partial pressure of oxygen a little bit. So that's our second unexpected numbers. These numbers were at first a little unexpected. But again, we uh, made sense of it and understand why, because of the mixing of the air. And now this number uh, at first didn't make a lot of sense, but now we understand why that's the case as well. All right. Questions on that? All right, then let's take a look at what's happening here. Now we have, um, so back to that, back to that. Our Oxygen-rich blood now leaves the heart to go to our systemic artery. <coughs> Excuse me. And is it going to change from the heart to the tissues where the gas exchange is going to take place? It shouldn't. No, this time it doesn't. It doesn't indeed. So now, again, our... Um, what? blood as it enters the systemic capillary. We have a partial pressure of oxygen that is equal to 100 millimeters of mercury and a partial pressure of CO2 uh, that is equal to 40 millimeters of mercury. So let's, I'm going to sneak this up here. Actually, let's do it this way. I'll put that there. And then if I do that, that should get that there out of our way. That can go there. Perfect. All right. Oops. I need a little bit more space there. Perfect. Excellent. I think that works. Excellent. That fit. So now we get down here to the tissues. Our tissues are, of course, doing their cellular respiration. Right, and oh, I'm going to need more room, so I'll sneak and put it over the tissues. Cellular respiration, of course, is where we completely break down glucose. Need more space, so let's cheat. 
sugar. And we do that uh, by using oxygen to break it down completely so that we produce energy. That energy, of course, is used to make ATP. And then the two waste products are water and carbon dioxide. Right? This is our cellular respiration. This is what is going on inside of our cell. Now, let's assume that this cell is at rest. If the cell is at rest, is it necessarily doing a tremendous amount of metabolism, using a tremendous amount of energy? No. No, but it still has pumps, and it still has channels, and it still has all these other things. So it is going to be doing some. So let's say, for argument's sake, at rest, it's been using some of the oxygen that is in its environment, and the partial pressure of oxygen has dropped to about 40 millimeters of mercury, All right, as it's been using that oxygen. It is, of course, producing CO2 as a waste of this, so our partial pressure of CO2 is going to be equal to 45. All right, this is the cell at rest. All right, so at rest, oh, I actually need a teeny bit more room, so let's cheat and do that there. So when it gets to our capillary, we are going to get, um, and I will cheat and sneak it in here, my internal gas exchange. And with that internal gas exchange, which way is oxygen going to move? Out. out of the blood. Out of the blood, excellent. Out of the blood into the tissues, whereas our carbon dioxide is gonna move out of the tissue and into the blood. All right, so that is the gas exchange. Now again, remember the goal is going to be to reach equilibrium. But again, think of it, are the tissues and the systemic capillaries the same size? No. No. So once again, it is going to be the pressures of the tissue that are going to drive the partial pressure changes. And so as the blood leaves uh, the systemic capillary, the partial pressure of oxygen is going to equal what? 40. Excellent. And the partial pressure of CO2 is going to equal 45, which, if you look at it, is where we started. And now this blood, now oxygen poor, at the partial pressure of 40, and a partial pressure of CO2 of 45, is going to go back to the heart, be pumped to the lungs, and the whole process is gonna start all over again. All right. Now, there's one more thing we need to add to this. Notice I said here at rest, if the tissue is active, then what'll happen is that it will use even more oxygen. So the partial pressure of oxygen can be less than 40. Uh, I'm not gonna have enough room for all of this. So I'll just put less. For some 40. reason I'm not able to see that. Well, uh, maybe because I'm still typing it. Can you not see any of the writing or just this particular statement that I'm writing right now? Uh, just that statement you're writing right now. Okay, well, let me finish writing and hopefully that'll clear up then. Uh, and then the partial pressure of CO2 is going to be a more than 45. All right, so if I stop, can you see it now? No. Oh, if I move it up here, can you see it up here? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, weird. Okay, I guess I can't put it between the writing. Maybe I was just trying to fit it in too tight. So no, I think the bar is like blocking it where you can see like, you know, the oh, inside. Oh yeah, there's something in there. Okay, perfect. Well, so here, the important thing is that you can see it here. The key point that I want to emphasize is that this was the tissue at rest. 
And so notice if this, if the tissue is active and the partial pressure of the oxygen in the tissue is down to 20 millimeters of mercury, then that just means it's going to get more oxygen. More oxygen is going to come out of the blood until the blood is now 20 millimeters of mercury. So the more active the tissue is, the more oxygen we're going to give it. The more that the tissue is producing carbon dioxide, the more carbon dioxide it's going to give the blood. So again, since it is the tissues that's driving it, if it's more active, then it can be more than um, 45 for CO2, it can be less than 40 for the oxygen, and because it's going to drive the diffusion, it'll be able to get more oxygen. So the more active the tissue is, the more oxygen it's gonna get, the more active the tissue is, the more CO2 it's gonna give off. Does that make sense? Excellent, blank stares mean yes, so excellent. All right, we have made a beautiful mess of the board here, uh, but we do have actually the pretty pictures from your textbook that show this stuff too. So I'm gonna erase it and go through it again with the pretty pictures from your book, but uh, here has the explanation, here has the description. So I wanna make sure you see this and understand. Understand some of the quirky stuff, like why these numbers do not equal this number why this number does not equal this number. Make sure you understand those bits of it uh, so that it makes sense, and then I'll clear the board and we'll go through it again. So again, any questions on this before I erase the board and we move forward? All right, excellent. So let's go ahead and clear all the drawings and do this again with all the pretty pictures. So again, notice this is the inspired air, that title volume that we're bringing in, but remember, as we talked about, in when it gets to the lungs, because this is just half of a liter being mixed with over two liters of air that is already there, they mix together. And when they mix together, again, if you have a big pitcher of room temperature water and you pour a cup of boiling water into it, the whole pitcher isn't suddenly boiling water. You've just added a little warmth to it. And that's what's happening here. We're adding very oxygen-rich blood, very low, C uh, pardon me, very oxygen-rich air, very uh, CO2-poor air into the lungs, mixing with what's there, and this is the result. The partial pressure of oxygen is 104. The partial pressure of CO2 is 40. And that is where our gas exchange takes place. As the blood leaves, it is a partial pressure of 104. Uh, as it leaves the pulmonary capillary, Partial pressure of CO2 is 40, but notice as the blood leaves the heart, it's down to 100. And remember, the reason we get this slight drop in oxygen levels uh, from when it first gas exchanged is because of that bronchial circulation. The bronchial circulation is adding some oxygen poor blood back into the pulmonary veins, and it drops the oxygen level of it slightly. This blood then goes to the tissues, where the tissues, again, have been acted, active or at rest. So again, for oxygen, it can be uh, less than 40 millimeters of mercury or 40 millimeters at rest. It can be 45 at rest or it can be more, depending on how active the tissue is. And again, oxygen will come into the tissues. CO2 will leave the tissues until it equalizes to whatever the tissue was. Again, this tissue is at rest, so 40 millimeters of oxygen, 45 of CO2, and then the process starts all over again. So here we see how, because it is a passive process, it is the partial pressures of these gases uh, that drive the diffusion. Get the oxygen and the CO2 to go the direction we want it to go in the locations, in the two areas of gas exchange. Our uh, external gas exchange, which takes place between a pulmonary capillary and the alveolus, and our internal gas exchange, which takes place between a systemic capillary and the tissue. Again, you guys know I'm not a big, huge numbers person, but these are numbers you must know. Know your partial pressures in all of these environments and how they change and the effect they have. All right, questions on that? All 
All right, excellent. Silence. Uh, hold on, I need a drink. All right, excellent. Now, one more thing that we want to talk about this. Notice here is actually a great graph that shows us that loading of oxygen into the blood in that pulmonary capillary. Notice as our blood enters into the capillary, as we know, the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 millimeters of mercury. And when it leaves, it is 104. Right, we have that 104 when it leaves. And notice it doesn't spend a tremendous amount of time inside of the capillary. That blood, even though all the red blood cells have to line up in single file order to get through it, it takes three quarters of a second to get through our lungs. To, well, to really, to, not to get through our lungs, but to get through our pulmonary capillary. However, notice it doesn't take the whole time for it to load it loads very, very quickly. In fact, it loads by about uh, a quarter of a second. It has almost reached 100% of its saturation. So this is a process that occurs very, very, very quickly. One of the significant things about this has to do with oxygen deprivation or our oxygen debt. If you think back to the cardiovascular, uh, pardon me, the muscular system in 430, as we exercise, our muscle cells incur an oxygen debt, right? They use up all the oxygen that is being provided to them. They have to start making their ATP anaerobically. They build up that lactic acid. They get fatigued, right? They start to perform less optimally. That oxygen debt, as we talked about back in 430, is at the cellular level. It does not have to do with how much oxygen you are getting into the blood. The amount of oxygen you get into the blood is the same. If you think about this, right, here while you're sitting here at rest, it takes the blood three quarters of a second to get through your cap pulmonary capillary. And your resting heart rate while you're sitting here right now is what? 60 to 70, 60 to 80. Yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go 70 because it's a nice round number. 70 uh, beats per minute. If you're beating at that, it takes three quarters of a second for the blood to get to the pulmonary capillary. What that means is you could triple your heart rate, meaning that the blood would only go through the capillary at a third of the rate. So your heart rate could go from 70 beats a minute to 200 beats a minute. And even with your heart beating 200 beats a minute, you would still be able to fully saturate your blood with the oxygen that it's carrying. So notice the oxygen debt you have isn't how quickly you can get the oxygen in the blood. It's not an issue of getting the oxygen in the blood. It's an issue of getting that oxygen into the cells. It's one of the things that I always love. Again, back in ancient times, there used to be things called football games. And in football games, large groups of people would get together in very tight, close spaces, which again, I know is illegal now. Uh, but what I loved about it is especially uh, when like a defensive player. A defensive player would uh, intercept the ball, run it back for a touchdown. He'd run to the sidelines and he'd do two things. The first thing he would do is wave to the camera and say, hi, mom. The second thing he would do is grab an oxygen mask and put an oxygen mask on to get that oxygen because he's just so fatigued from that. And guess what? That oxygen mask does absolutely nothing. That oxygen mask isn't helping him to get the oxygen into the blood, right? Even if his, blood, if his heart rate was beating 200 beats a minute, which I'm sure it's not. It may feel that way, but it's probably not. Uh, he's able to fully saturate his uh, blood with oxygen. So the oxygen debt that he's feeling is at the cellular level, not here in the lungs. So our lungs are incredibly efficient at getting the oxygen into them that we need. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So, like I said, the goal is to get this super efficiency and let's go ahead and cheat and do, actually we'll do a drawing. So again, here we have our alveolus, here we have our pulmonary capillary.
And as we talked about, we know that in here, the partial pressure of oxygen is going to equal 104 millimeters of mercury. And uh, our partial pressure, oops, partial pressure of oxygen, our partial pressure of CO2 is going to be equal to uh, 40 millimeters of mercury. And here in our pulmonary capillary, our partial pressure of oxygen is equal to 40 millimeters of mercury, and our partial pressure of CO2 is equal to 45 millimeters of mercury. All right, because of that, we know that we've got our oxygen, which is coming in, our CO2, which is going out, and everything that we just finished talking about, except it's not exactly the case. Yes, when you breathe in air, that air mixes with the air that is already in the lungs, and as it mixes with the in the lungs, it gets to be a value as close to this, but we have a, over a million alveoli. And is every single one of those million alveoli going to have the exact same partial pressures of oxygen and the exact same partial pressures of CO2 in them? No. No, of course not. So what that means is there are gonna be variations. Some are gonna have more oxygen, some are gonna have more CO2, some are gonna have less oxygen, some are gonna have less CO2. There is going to be variations, right? And that's the problem. Each alveoli, really H of A less, has its own unique environment. And because of that, there's gonna be minor fluctuations in these. And because of that, there is going to be variations in how efficient of the gas exchange in each of those 1 million alveoli. So what we need, because this is a passive process, we need to optimize this. And luckily, we have an inherent intrinsic process. Remember, intrinsic means that it is inherent within. We have an intrinsic process where we can actually monitor conditions. where we can monitor the conditions to improve the efficiency of our capillary exchange that is taking place, all right? So basically, the two things we have to put together, and of course, that is what couple means, couple means to put together, are ventilation and perfusion. To do this, we need to, of course, define these things first. Ventilation is the movement of air into and out of the alveolus. And perfusion is the movement of blood, I guess we can use the same terms, into and out of the pulmonary capillary. All right. Ventilation is the movement of air in the alveolus. Perfusion is the movement of blood in the pulmonary capillary. We need to um, coordinate these two concepts to make this gas exchange as efficient as possible. All right, so let's go ahead and erase this and do this with the pretty pictures, or more specifically with the pretty words. So again, ventilation is the amount of gas, the movement of air reaching the alveolus. Perfusion is the amount of blood, ooh, excuse me, blood flow going into the pulmonary capillary. We want to tightly regulate and maximize the efficiency of these uh, for gas exchange to take place. This is an intrinsic 
or auto regulatory process. What this means is these changes are occurring at every single alveolus and every single pulmonary capillary. Right? This is not something that our nervous system could control from the outside. As impressive as our nervous system is, it's not going to be able to control the dynamic changes that are occurring second by second inside of the lungs. So the lungs themselves are self-monitoring this at the local point. Here at the alveolus, here at the pulmonary capillary, it is this auto-regulatory process. And one of the important things to remember, uh, let's, I'll go ahead and write it here first. Uh, in this auto-regulatory process, there are two main rules. Rule one, the partial pressure, oops, don't want the catwalk on anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me, apologize for that. The partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus, that I do want in capitals, the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus determines the diameter of the pulmonary arterial. All right, that is rule number one. Rule number two is that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, again, in the alveolus, determines the diameter of the, uh, let's say, uh, terminal bronchiole. So those are our two rules. Notice oxygen and carbon dioxide have their own control mechanisms. And again, we are measuring the oxygen and the carbon dioxide in the alveolus. So in the alveolus, oxygen levels affect the diameter of our pulmonary arteriole. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveolus determines the diameter of the terminal bronchiole. All right, do we at least have the rules? It's okay if you don't understand them yet. We'll see how they work in just a minute, but do you at least have the rules? No. Yep. All right, excellent. So let's go through these now. Uh, clear my drawing. Talk about the first rule, all right? Now, let's start with the drawing. Think about how this works. Let's put the drawing in the middle. Here is my alveolus. Here is my pulmonary capillary. Now remember, rule one involves the partial pressure of oxygen in our alveolus, okay? Now, let's think about this. In the situation where our alveolus has a high level of oxygen, inside of it. In this case, um, would it be a good environment for gas exchange? Okay. Would this be, would this be a uh, alveolus that we would want gas exchange to do? Okay. Hey. <laughs> I appreciate the enthusiasm, but I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. You can unmute if you need to talk, but just to, 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 just to limit the distractions. So I'll ask the question again. If there is a high level of oxygen in this alveolus, would this be conducive for gas exchange? Yes. Absolutely. So in this case, the answer would be yes. So that would mean, would we want to increase or decrease 
the amount of blood that was coming here? Increase? Yeah, again. So in this case, notice we would want to, oops, increase the perfusion, right? Which again, is just a fancy way of saying we want to bring more blood for gas exchange. All right? So in this case, we have a high level, bingo. Nope, doesn't fit. Okay, well, just do that. Excellent. We have a high level of oxygen, and the answer here is, of course, yes. It is a good environment for gas exchange, so we would want to bring this in here. And so we would want to increase perfusion. We want to bring more blood to this pulmonary capillary. Remember, this is our pulmonary capillary. Oops, what happened? To our pulmonary capillary. And since oxygen levels affect the terminal arteriole, the one that brings blood to the capillary, what would we want to do to the capillary to bring more blood to it? Well, what do we want to do to the terminal arteriole? Well, terminal arteriole is what brings blood to the capillaries. Would we want, and if we want more blood to come to this capillary, what would we want to do to our terminal arteriole? Dilate. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to dilate the terminal arteriole. We dilate the terminal arteriole, we get an increase blood flow, which again, an increased perfusion. Perfusion. And more gas exchange takes place. All right, basically what this is saying is, hey, this Avilas is saying, hey, I got a ton of oxygen in me. Come on in, boys, bring the blood in. We need to bring the blood in because I'm a great location for gas exchange to take place. All right, that makes sense? Hopefully. Yep. All right, let's think of the opposite then. What if the alveolus has a low level? of oxygen. Is this going to be good for gas exchange? Nope. Nope. I want to be consistent. Good look for gas exchange. And as we just mentioned, uh, let's go green for that. Uh, the answer to that is, oops, no, hold on. I know it's anal of me to care what the color is, but it makes me happy. No, it does not, absolutely. So in this case, what we want to do is we want to decrease perfusion or bring less blood for gas exchange. And of course, how are we gonna do that? Constricting the terminal arterial. There you go, we constrict the terminal arterial. All right, that decreases blood flow. Or decreases perfusion. And, right, less, gas exchange occurs, right? With a low level of oxygen in here, basically this alveolus is saying, hey guys, I'm not the best alveolus for gas exchange, send the blood someplace else. It's not gonna be as efficient here, so send it someplace else. So notice, we talk about how partial pressure of oxygen changes the diameter of the terminal arteriole. The other way we can then think about this is that our partial pressure of oxygen controls perfusion. All right. 
Hopefully that's pretty straightforward, makes sense. Any questions on that? Yes. Yes, go ahead. So earlier you said when there was two rules, you said for the first rule, um, the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus determines the diameter of the pulmonary arteriole, but on the screen it says terminal arteriole. Well, so again, remember this great question. Uh, this is a pulmonary capillary. As we know, all capillaries are fed into by arterioles and fed out of into venules. In this case, I'm using the term terminal just to mean that it is the one that directly feeds into the capillary. So it's literally the arteriole that is right here. Now it is a pulmonary capillary, so it is a pulmonary arteriole. I just was trying to emphasize that it's the one right here. It's the one that directly feeds into this one capillary, as okay. opposed to some other pulmonary arteriole that could feed into multiple capillaries. I mean the one that just feeds directly into this capillary right here. So this is a pulmonary capillary, but it's the very last pulmonary capillary, uh, pardon me, pulmonary arteriole, but it's the very last pulmonary arteriole feeding into this one specific capillary. Okay. That, so that's all I meant from that. So thank you. I apologize for that confusion. But yes, that, that, that's the key. I use terminal here because I want to make sure we're emphasizing it's just the one feeding into this capillary. Okay. All right. Great question. Any others? All right. Excellent. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and clear this so that we can then uh, go back. Actually, I can stay there and see this again. Um, now, our second rule, as we mentioned, is that changes in the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveolus cause changes in the diame diameter of the bronchioles. So I know I just erased it. Oh, I wonder if I can go back. Yeah, let's do that. I'll cheat. Uh, so let's go back on the lecture. No, actually, I don't want to go. Uh, that's not going to fit as well. All right, let me see what I can do here. I want to get rid of that, and 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 that. Um, but I want to grab that and move it down. 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 But I need to get rid of that. Perfect. Excellent. There you go. Look at that. It saved myself a little bit of time. Perfect. So now our goal is going to be to talk about the relation of CO2. Now again, the partial pressure of CO2 inside of the alveolus controls the diameter of the bronchiole. And so again, if you think about it, this up here is our bronchiole that feeds into the alveolus. Oops, so I spell it right. And I wonder if that will fit inside of the neck. And we'll cheat, do it close enough. There you go, all right. So that is our bronchiole that feeds into it. No, I don't like that. All right, so that is the bronchiole right there. We comfortable with that? All right, let's think in terms of what we did before. Now all we care about is the partial pressure of CO2. We don't care about the partial pressure of oxygen. Both of these are independent. Gases are independent of each other. So in this case, what happens if the partial pressure of, uh, we did high first, let's do high again. CO2 is high. If the partial pressure of CO2 is high, is this gas necessarily going to be good for gas exchange? Is this good gas for gas exchange? If it has a high level of CO2 in it? Nope. No, probably not. Absolutely not. Uh, so, oops, no. Good gravy. And the answer, of course, is no. And so what that means is that we want to get rid of this gas. 
And the way we're going to get rid of this gas is we need to get rid of this gas. So we need to increase our ventilation. Oops. We want to get rid of this gas. We want to increase our ventilation. And if we're going to increase our ventilation, what are we going to want to do to our bronchiole? I'm dilate it. Excellent. We want to dilate the bronchiole. And if we dilate the bronchiole, that old air leaves and we increase our ventilation. We can get more air in. More new air in. All right? So in that case, we dilate our bronchiole and that allows for an increase in ventilation. Conversely, if the partial pressure of CO2 is low, is this going to be good gas for gas exchange? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So in this case, the answer is absolutely yes. And as such, we want to keep the air. And if we want to keep the air, right, or in this case, decrease the ventilation, how would we do that? Constrict the bronchial. There you go. So we want to keep, again, the good air. So the way we do this is by constricting the bronchiole. And if we constrict that bronchiole, we keep the good air and this air stays in the alveolus. And because it is conducive to good gas exchange. So notice the conditions of CO2 affect the diameter of the bronchioles, or like we mentioned before, the partial pressure of oxygen controls perfusion, and notice it is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide that controls ventilation. So, in this process of controlling ventilation, perfusion, coupling, controlling these things, uh, it is oxygen and CO2 levels separately, independently uh, of each other that control our perfusion, control our ventilation. But the goal is the same. The goal is to make this environment as conducive as possible for that passive gas exchange to take place. And the beauty of this system is every single one of the millions of uh, alveoli with the dozens of capillaries they have wrapped around them uh, can have dynamic immediate changes to their conditions to try to make this process as efficient as possible. And again, the conditions of the air are independent. Now, in fairness, in this alveolus, if the oxygen levels are low, what are the CO2 levels likely to be? Hi. High, right. And if CO2 levels are low, then oxygen levels are likely to be high, right? But it doesn't have to be that way. Oxygen and CO2 could both be high in this, in which case we would bring more blood to the air because of the high oxygen, but the high CO2 would also increase this for ventilation as well. So again, they can be independent. Yes, air that tends to have a low oxygen tends to have high CO2, but it doesn't have to. Each of these are gonna have their effects independently. Oxygen and CO2 don't affect each other. All right, they're typically related, but depending on the conditions, they don't necessarily have to be. All right, excellent. So I've done it here in the words. Uh, we've talked about this a lot, but again, we have these great pretty pictures from your textbook. And again, it emphasizes the conditions here. Notice here we have a mismatch. In this case, we have a 
large blood supply to uh, an environment here that has a low level of oxygen and a high level of CO2. This is definitely air that is not conducive. So the partial pressure of oxygen being low is going to lead to the constriction of the blood vessels, decreasing perfusion to the area. And the high level of CO2 is going to dilate the uh, capillary, uh, pardon me, dilate the uh, bronchioles so that we can increase ventilation. So notice, as we said, the oxygen level being low causes a constriction of the blood vessels and we get a decrease in perfusion to this area. So we have a low ventilation. It's got that high carbon dioxide, low uh, uh, partial pressure of oxygen, so we constrict the blood flow. But remember, this high level of carbon dioxide is going to lead to an increase in ventilation. It dilates the airway, the bronchiole, so now more air comes in. And as that more air comes in, we have a higher partial pressure of oxygen. Now we have a high level partial pressure of oxygen, but a very low perfusion of blood to that. So of course, that oxygen level leads to the dilation of the blood vessels, bringing more blood to the area because this is now an environment that is better for gas exchange. And so these types of dynamic changes, changes in perfusion, changes in ventilation are going to constantly be occurring to try to make this environment as efficient as possible, as maximize the efficiency because we need to, because it is a passive process. And that's really the key. The whole reason we have to do all of these things is because we don't want to use uh, ATP to get oxygen in or CO2 out. So we need to, if it's passive, we need to make it as efficient as possible. All right, questions on that? All right, now that we've talked about, oh, and again, here's the pretty picture that puts them all together. I'll leave you guys on that one. Now that we have talked about that, we need two more things that we need to talk about. We need to talk about the transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide and how that occurs, because we know that is related to respiration. And we are ultimately gonna to need to talk about control, how we control this process. It's gonna be a little bit trickier doing it on the computer like this and not in the classroom, but we'll simplify this, make it a little bit easier and hopefully it will make some sense. This is a good natural stopping point, so let's go ahead and take our next break. Uh, we will take a 10 minute break, come back at 10.20, and uh, at 10.20 uh, we will resume. And I will remind myself to start the recording at that time as well. So before we start our break, any questions on any of the things that we just finished co uh, covering? That ventilation perfusion coupling. This is one of those big major physiological processes, very likely to be an essay question. And again, not only do you need to know the definitions and understand the concepts, but if I gave you an example of high CO2 levels or high oxygen levels and those types of things, you need to know how this process responds. So any questions on this before we take our break? All right, excellent. Uh, go stretch, drink, pee, whatever it is that you need to do. I will meet you back here in 10 minutes. <clears throat> Any questions before we jump back in? All right, excellent. All righty. So, what we need to talk about now, we've talked about uh, gas exchange, we've talked about pulmonary ventilation. Uh, we still need to talk a bit about how it is transported. We got a little hint of that from the picture that we saw before, uh, but let's talk more about it. Uh, starting first with oxygen, because oxygen is definitely the easier of the two to understand when it talks about transportation. And that's because pretty much all of the oxygen, <clears throat> excuse me, about 98.5% of the oxygen is transported bound to hemoglobin. Again, uh, I'll cheat and do my little quick drawing here. Hemoglobin, remember, as we talked about in the cardiovascular system, is a globular protein made up of four subunits. Each of those subunits in the center of them have a heme group. And at the center of each of those heme groups, 
as we talked about, is an iron. And that iron uh, that is at the center of that is where our oxygen binds. So a single hemoglobin, so one uh, hemoglobin uh, is able to carry, oh, let's say it this way, carries, can carry up to four oxygen. All right. So we have uh, that, and again, as we talked about, a single red blood cell has somewhere on the order of 250 million hemoglobin inside of it. And remember, a single drop of blood has somewhere on the order of 5 million red blood cells in it. So obviously, the oxygen-carrying capacity of our blood is tremendous. However, as we talked about, this binding site for the oxygen is also a site that is competed for by carbon monoxide. That's why carbon monoxide is such a dangerous uh, poison, because if it binds to there, oxygen cannot. And only about one and a half percent of the oxygen that your blood carries is dissolved in the plasma. So if carbon monoxide is blocking your binding sites on your hemoglobin, you are not going to be able to get the oxygen that you need, and that can be very, very dangerous. So again, only, and of course, when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, as we've mentioned, it forms oxyhemoglobin. Carbon dioxide is much more interesting. Yes, uh, some of it is dissolved in the blood, like oxygen. Again, if 80, 98.5% uh, is bound to the hemoglobin, then that means 1.5% is bound, uh, pardon me, is, uh, dissolved in the plasma. And as you can see, much more of the carbon dioxide is dissolved in the plasma uh, than there is oxygen, but seven to 10% is still not a large amount. Some of it does bind to hemoglobin, All right? Remember, one of the things that we talked about is that uh, oxygen uh, and carbon dioxide both bind to hemoglobin, but they have different binding sites. If we cheat and just look at the heme group, as we talked about in that heme group at the center is that iron, and that is where the oxygen binds. The oxygen is gonna to bind to that iron, whereas the binding site for carbon dioxide is kind of out here. It's not the same seat. They're not fighting for the same seat. However, it is like my daughters, Right? When one of them is sitting on the couch, there's plenty of room for the second one. But just because there's plenty of room for the second one doesn't necessarily mean that they both want to be on there at the same time. So if Big is sitting on the couch, it's less likely that Little is going to want to sit there. If Little is sitting on the couch, it's less likely that Big is going to want to sit there. But if need be, they can both be on there at the same time. And that's the same thing here. Uh, the binding of carbon dioxide makes oxygen less likely to bind and vice versa, but both are not competing for the same site, uh, so we don't have to worry about that. And when carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin, it becomes one of those big, huge alphabet soup words that you can be damn near guaranteed you're going to have to spell on an exam. Carboamino hemoglobin. Carboamino hemoglobin. So that is, a, but once you write it out once, and for instance, an essay question, you can abbreviate it HbCO2. But notice also that's only about 20% as well. That leaves about 70% left. And that 70% that is left, the primary way carbon dioxide is transported in the blood is by being converted into bicarbonate. Carbon has this magical, mystical uh, thing that happens to it when it binds to water. We talked about this, uh, I think, in the last lecture, but I will emphasize it again. I will write it out here, uh, but I think I have the pretty picture that shows this as well. But basically, the key to this is carbon dioxide, uh, when it binds to, when it is uh, mixed with water, oops, when it is mixed with water, it basically becomes carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is H2CO3. Uh, All right. However, 
carbonic acid is an acid and like all acids, it likes to disassociate, right? It forms hydrogen ions and uh, it forms bicarbonate, which is HCO3 negative. So basically uh, carbon dioxide plus water equals acid and that acid has the ability to disassociate. Now, again, I have the uh, pretty picture that, oops, wrong button, that shows that. Here we go. It's nice and big so we can see that. Carbon dioxide mixes with water and it forms carbonic acid. Carbonic acid disassociates into hydrogen and bicarbonate. And here is really the key to this. This is a reversible reaction. What that means is depending on the conditions, it will drive this in certain directions. And there's lots of ways this can occur, but let's talk about the most important for what we're gonna be dealing with. If carbon dioxide were to increase in an environment, which way would that drive this chemical reaction? To the right or to the left? To the right. Yeah, it would drive it to the right. More carbon dioxide would mix with the water and form bicarbonate. This is, for instance, what happens in our systemic capillary. In the systemic capillary, oops, that's what I want. In that systemic capillary, uh, we have an increase of carbon dioxide entering into the blood. That blood is gonna mix with the water and it is gonna form carbonic acid and disassociate into hydrogen and bicarbonate. And so like we said, about 70% of the uh, carbon dioxide is going to be converted into bicarbonate this way. However, let's think about what happens when we get to the lungs. When we get to the lungs, in the lungs, we start to unload the carbon dioxide. So the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood is going to go down. And when the amount of carbon dioxide goes down in the blood, as carbon dioxide is leaving into the lungs, which way is that gonna drive the reaction then? To the left to the left. So now that bicarbonate is going to come out of solution, become carbon dioxide gas again, that can then be expelled in the lungs. So this is what is going to happen in our pulmonary capillary. So in our pulmonary capillary, it's going to move in the opposite direction. So here we load up carbon dioxide systemically and convert it into bicarbonate. But when we get to the lungs, that bicarbonate is converted back to carbon dioxide that can be expelled via that external gas exchange. So in this fashion, we are able to use this as a means of transporting. This also indicates to us why at the lungs, we're not getting rid of all of the carbon dioxide. If we got rid of all of the carbon dioxide, we would be getting rid of a tremendous amount of hydrogen ions. One of the key things is carbon dioxide equals acid. It affects the pH of the blood. And we don't want the blood to be totally basic. We don't want it to be totally acidic either. We want it somewhere in between. And so we don't want to get rid of all the CO2 because we want some of these hydrogen ions. We want to maintain a more stable pH. And so that's why the amount of carbon dioxide that moves between 45 and 40 is much more narrow. We need to get rid of excess, but we want to keep a hold of a lot of it because a lot of it helps to maintain the pH of our blood. One of the key parts of this is this process and this bicarbonate in particular is a very important buffer, right? That's that key word that blood buffer that is gonna to help to maintain the pH in the body. And that is super, super important. All right, now, not surprisingly, there is an enzyme that helps to facilitate both chemical reactions. Carbonic anhydrase helps to convert carbon dioxide into bicarbonate, but it also helps to convert bicarbonate into carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide. So it moves in both directions. This is a super important enzyme to help in this process. And so you'd probably want it someplace where it would be really, really helpful. And this carbonic anhydrase, this enzyme is actually found 
inside of our red blood cells. Inside of our erythrocytes is where we have the carbonic anhydrase because that is what is going to help to facilitate uh, that chemical reaction. All right, questions on that? So there you go. So again, uh, adding carbon dioxide to water affects the pH. We're actually going to get a chance to see this. Hopefully you'll get a chance to see this in your lab that we are doing today. So hopefully you will have the opportunity to do that. If not, you will do it as a thought experiment. All right, uh, clear that. All right, so questions on that? We have a pretty picture that we'll look at at the end of this that puts this all together. Uh, but what we need to do, if this makes sense, is we need to go back to this idea of oxygen and how we load the oxygen because there is a very important process that I guarantee is going to be an essay question on the exam. All right. Uh, and this is the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. All right. Uh, I am going to draw uh, this curve once so we can talk about it, but then we'll use the pretty pictures to show it. How many? Oxygen can bind to a hemoglobin again? Four. Four. Right. four. Up to four, absolutely. However, the primary factor that determines how much oxygen binds to a hemoglobin is the partial pressure of the oxygen in the blood. Oops. All right. This is our rule. The primary factor is what determines is the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. So let's do that. On our graph down here, we have the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. blood. Uh, and I'm going to cheat. No, I'll leave it there. I like it there. It's different. Um, over here is the percent of oxygen bound to the blood. All right. Now, Let's think of this in simple terms. A single hemoglobin can bind up to four. Uh, I need to move this down. Partial pressures in the blood, as we've talked about, can be, um, hopefully not, but could technically be as low as zero millimeters of mercury. And let's think about this. If there was no blood pardon me, no oxygen in the blood, how many oxygen would be binding to a single hemoglobin? Zero. Zero. So you would have zero bound. And of course, that would be 0%. All right. Make sense? So we can actually draw a point on our graph. That would be right there. Let's change the color of that so we can see it. That didn't work. Oh well, doesn't matter. Uh, highlight that. Change it. Does that work? No, nope, I don't care. Oh, fine. Whatever. Zero percent. Now, if we think in biological terms, probably the area where there is the most oxygen in the blood is in the lungs. In the blood vessels, in that pulmonary capillary, what was the partial pressure of our um, oxygen again? Partial pressure of oxygen in the pulmonary capillary was? 160. 104. Yeah, and the capillary is 104. You're right. In the outside world, it's 160, but it is 104 in the pulmonary capillary. Now, in that environment, how many oxygen do you think are binding to our hemoglobin at that, at that point? Four. Probably four, absolutely. It's actually super close to four. Um, 
but yeah, essentially we're going to have four bound, which would of course be right. 100%, 100% saturation would be basically what that is. And so that point would be up there. Oh, sure. Now it's red. Okay. doesn't matter. I don't want that. Let's do that too. Pretty. Excellent. All right. You with me so far? Yes. Excellent. So notice every other place in the body is going to be somewhere in between these two values. Normally, in most circumstances, when you have two points on a curve, base, I mean two points, you can draw a line between them, and that would give you the curve for how much oxygen would bind to a hemoglobin based on what the partial pressure of oxygen is. And that would totally work, except there's one more rule. And that one more rule, as it turns out, is the binding of one oxygen makes it easier for another to bind. There we go. Makes it easier for another to bind. So what that means is that as our oxygen binds to it, what we end up getting is more of this kind of a um, sigmoidal type of curve that is going to look something like that. Because what happens is when oxygen binds, it makes it easier for the other to bind. But it also means that as one oxygen lets go, it makes it easier for the other one to let go. So I've done a horrible job. Let's do this a little bit more like that. Now that's horrible as well. All right, I don't care. We'll see the pre-picture from your textbook in just a minute. So in any particular environment within our body, if we know the partial pressure, we will know the percent that is bound. Now, we do know one more partial pressure that we've talked about. What did we say the partial pressure of the oxygen was in the tissues when the tissues were at rest? Forty. Forty. Excellent. Perfect. So we do know another pressure. So we can add another point to our graph here. If we were to do this, and I know I haven't done the greatest job of lining this up, but we'll make it work. Uh, yes, yeah, I have to cheat now. Let's move this a little bit more this way. That'll work. If we were to look at the point where it was 40, if we were to take our line up this way and come across this way, what we would see is right here, we would be at a 75% saturation. And at that point, how many oxygen would be bound to the hemoglobin? Three. Three bound. So let's think about what happens. Our blood goes to the lungs where the partial pressure is 104 and the hemoglobin there loads up with four oxygen. So it has four oxygen bound to it. That blood is then transported uh, to, for instance, your foot right now, which isn't doing a whole heck of a lot. So it is at rest and it is as it is at rest, uh, its partial pressure is four, and there in your foot, the blood gives off one hemoglobin. Three stay bound, but it gives off one to your resting tissue. And then it goes back to the lungs, and when it gets back to the lungs, it loads back up in four. And then it goes to your other foot, and then back to the lungs. And then it goes to you know some other part of your body that's at rest, and back to the lungs, and so on and so forth. But what if instead, this time it goes to, and let's say you're, say you're taking good notes, and let's say you're right-handed, it is going to your right hand as you're furiously trying to take notes. It turns out the partial pressure in that environment, because it's more active in using more of it, let's say it's something like 17 millimeters of mercury in that environment, in your hand. What happens then is when the blood gets to your hand, uh, there's my line. If we look at our curve, we see at that point, 
it only has a 25% saturation rate, which means how many oxygen are bound to the hemoglobin there? One. So now notice when our blood goes to our hand that is furiously typing, it now gives three oxygen to that tissue. And then of course it goes back to the lungs and loads up to four. And then it goes to your foot and it only gives one. And then maybe you're typing, so it goes to your fingers and it gives off three. Notice the beauty of this is that tissue is only receiving how much oxygen it needs based on how much it has. The more oxygen it's using, the less that's available, the more oxygen the hemoglobin gives it. So that's really the key. This graph shows that the more oxygen is being used by a tissue, the lower the partial pressure of oxygen is, the less oxygen binds to the hemoglobin, so more oxygen is released to that tissue. Of course, when it goes to the lungs, it's saturated, it fully loads, loads up with that four, and then it can go to different parts of the body and give the oxygen that it needs. All right, does this make sense? It's gonna get a lot worse. So if this doesn't make sense, you gotta let me know now. If there's anything that's not clear about this, we'll go through it again with the prettier pictures, but uh, we, it is going to get worse. So I wanna make sure we understand this. All right, so now let's clear the drawings and go through the pretty pictures from your textbook. So again, as we mentioned, it can bind four, but there is a new rule. Each oxygen binding enhances the binding of a second, and that gives us our saturation of hemoglobin, that percentage, with four bound being 100%, none bound being 0%. And like I said, the primary factor that determines how much oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin is what the partial pressure is in the blood. Here is what I attempted to draw. Uh, but here we see it much, much nicer. I have to move my control panel out of the way so I can get to all of this. Perfect. So notice here, again, if there's no oxygen available in the blood, well, first of all, you have problems. But secondly, there is no oxygen to bind to the hemoglobin. So, of course, it's going to be zero. When it gets to the environment of the lungs, where the partial pressure is 104, the saturation is a near 100, not quite 100. And again, remember, we are if we were just talking about one hemoglobin, there would only be basically five states, 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100. But we're talking about billions of hemoglobin. So when we get to the lungs, do all billions of hemoglobin all get four? Most of them do, but one out of every 10,000, you know, or something crazy like that only gets three or something like that, right? It's near the back of the line, didn't get the toilet paper because it wasn't there soon enough or whatever it is. It's going to get close. Almost everybody's going to get it, but it's going to be a little under 100, but it's practically 100. And so notice, as we talked about, when a tissue is at rest, if we follow it up, that's about 75. When a tissue is active, right? then that's about 25. And I think I've got that pretty picture here. Perfect. Excellent. So here is the example that I just gave you. When you've got resting tissue and the blood gets to the resting tissue, only three are going to bind. When it gets to the lungs, four are going to bind. When it gets to active tissue, only one's going to bind. So basically it loads up in the lungs and then it gives oxygen to tissues and the awesome thing about this is it gives a tissues oxygen totally based on need. This one doesn't need as much, so it only gives it one. This tissue needs a lot more, so it gives three. All right, so again, this no new information here. This is exactly what we just did when I drew it. This is just a nice, prettier uh, view of this so that, that hopefully that makes some semblance of sense. All right, questions on that? Like I said, no new information here. This is all exactly what we just finished talking about, uh, but now's where things get a little bit worse. All right. Now, here's how it gets worse. As I mentioned, the primary factor that determines how much oxygen binds to a hemoglobin is the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. But the key thing with saying primary 
is that there are other factors that can change or modify the curve. And the reason for this is that while how much oxygen is available is one determinant of metabolic activity, there are other determinants of how active a tissue is. All right? And that's really the key. If you think about some of the other things, when a tissue is active, if you were to get up and run around the room and your tissues were become active, obviously one of the things that would change would be your temperature. So temperature can be an indication of increased metabolic activity. If you're running around the room a lot, you're gonna be producing more carbon dioxide from all of the metabolic activity that is going to take place. Also, your pH, whoops, your pH would change as well. Now, yes, some of that pH change is going to be by carbon dioxide. As we know, carbon dioxide mixes with the water and becomes an acid. But carbon dioxide, carbonic acid, isn't the only acid. Like, for instance, as we talked about, things like lactic acid are produced when we're metabolically active as well. So while these two are related, pH is its own factor. And the third, pardon me, the fourth factor that also can determine whether something is, uh, tissue is active, is metabolic wastes. These are the four other factors, and what I need to do, oops, I need to move this up a little bit out of the way. So I need to move this back down. Excellent, move that up there. Okay, these are all factors that could be an indication that a tissue is active. So let's think about this. If a tissue is active versus not active, make ourselves a little graph here. Uh, If the tissue was active, would we expect temperature to increase or decrease? Increase. Increase. If our tissue was active, would we expect CO2 to increase or decrease? Increase. Increase. If our tissue is active, would we expect metabolic, metabolic wastes to increase or decrease? Increase. Decrease. Excellent. Awesome. Everything is increasing. And so, of course, if uh, our tissue is active, would we expect the pH to increase or decrease? Decrease. Crap. Yep, it is going to decrease. Yep. So it's almost perfect, but not quite. But you get the idea. When the tissue is active, these are the changes we're going to see. And hopefully it is obvious, but we'll go ahead and do it anyway. When the tissue is not active, temperature is going to decrease. Uh, carbon dioxide levels will decrease. Uh, pH levels will increase. And metabolic wastes will decrease. So it's almost perfect, but not quite. That pesky pH screws things up for us. But uh, it is, if you think of it, an increase in acid. We get an increase in acid and a decrease in acid. So we could at least think of it that way if we wanted to. That might be a way to line them up. All right? You with me so far? Mostly. <laughs> Good, excellent, I like to hear that. All right, so here's the last little bit of this. And actually, I think I need to move all of this up so I have room for this last little bit. So you need to move up. You need to move up. Uh, you need to move up. Oops. There we go. Excellent. I can't do that on the board, so I actually like that part. All right, perfect. So, last thing. So, let's think of it this way. If the tissue is more active 
If temperature is going up, if CO2 levels go up, if the pH is decreasing, if the metabolic wastes are going up, if the tissue is more active, do we want more oxygen bound to the hemoglobin or less oxygen bound to the hemoglobin? Remember, you have two choices. It can be bound to the oxygen or it can be being given to the tissue. So do we want the more oxygen to the tissue or less oxygen to the tissue? More oxygen. So more oxygen to the tissue. Or we can think of it as then less bound to uh, the hemoglobin. All right. So in this case, with an increase in metabolic activity, we want more oxygen given to the tissue, less bound to the hemoglobin. So of course the opposite is gonna be true over here. Here we want less oxygen to the tissue, and or we want more bound to the hemoglobin. And let's change the color of that so that it'll be easier to tell. Perfect. All right. Hopefully all of that makes some semblance of sense. It's kind of intuitive. The more active the tissue is, the more oxygen we want to give it. The less, ox the less active the tissue is, the more oxygen we want to give it. And so the question then becomes, how does that affect our curve? In the case where it is more active, oops. We want to give it less, I mean, we give it more oxygen. So again, we want less bound. So what that means is that on every single point on this graph, we want it to go down. Every single point on this graph, even though the oxygen level is 40, if there's an increase in temperature, if there's an increase in CO2, if there's an increase in the acidity, if there's an increase in metabolic waste, in all of those areas, we want to give it more oxygen. We want less bound to the uh, hemoglobin. And so our curve uh, shifts down. However, here's the funny things about uh, graphs. If we, blah, blah, blah. if we shift all these points down, and then we redraw the curve, what it looks like is that while what's actually happening is the curve is shifting down, what it looks like is that the curve shifted to the right. So when there's more active, we want less bound, we wanna drop out the oxygen and the curve shifts to the right. Conversely, if it is less active, if there's a decrease in temperature, a decrease in carbon dioxide, a decrease in the acidity, a decrease in the metabolic wastes, we don't need to give the tissue as much oxygen. And so in this case, our curve shifts up. And notice if I do a poor job again, of drawing this curve like that there. Then when it is less active, oops, oops, I spell active right. We want more bound, we wanna give less oxygen. And so our curve shifts up. But what it looks like is that the curve shifts left. Now again, I appreciate I've done a poor job of, of writing this, but I do have the pretty pictures that go along with this. I just wanted to make sure to highlight these things first so that you understand what is going on. All right, so like I said, I've made a mess of this as we've looked at it, but let's actually look at the pretty pictures from the textbook. I'll leave this here one more second to make sure you guys get everything that I've written and everything that I've tried to done, do, but then let's look at it and uh, see if we can make it a little bit more pretty. Good question. Yes. So on the going back to that last drawing, that blue line that you have there, that's going to be the cell when it's at uh, its inactive state or just its normal state. 
this is the starting point. Yes, this is when we just consider partial pressure of oxygen. Because remember, partial pressure of oxygen is the primary factor. So if all we care about is the primary factor, this is going to be the saturation rate or the binding rate for our hemoglobin. So under normal conditions, primary factor is oxygen, and that is the blue curve. So uh, yes, the, but the brown line that you have drawn there is that what level of inactivity? Like, is it less active than? Does that make sense? I, I'm trying to word this, and it's difficult for me. I, I understand. So what? As we talked about, how much oxygen is available in a tissue is an indicator of how active the tissue is. Because from rational thought is the, the more oxygen that is in that area, the, I mean, the, the, let's say this way, the more active the tissue is, the more oxygen it's gonna need. And it's gonna be using that oxygen up for its cellular respiration. And so there will be less in the environment. So typically the more active a tissue is, the less oxygen is going to be available. And that's true most of the time. But let's go back again to some of the things we learned in 430. Remember, one of our skeletal muscle types is a fast glycolytic. Fast glycolytic muscle tissue, does it use a lot of oxygen to make ATP? Yes. No. Remember, no. the fast glycolytic breaks down the glucose just using glycolysis. That's why it fatigues so rapidly. You mm -hmm. can throw that powerful pitch or that powerful punch, but it doesn't efficiently use oxygen. It doesn't have a lot of mitochondria. It relies primarily on glycolysis for getting its ATP. So your fast twitch muscles could be very active, but you wouldn't necessarily see a huge drop in oxygen levels in that area. So in that case, how much oxygen is available wouldn't be the only factor you would want to look at to see how active a tissue was. In that case, there might still be a fair amount of oxygen. However, that fast glycolytic tissue is gonna produce a lot of heat. And so that increase in temperature basically tells the hemoglobin, hey hemoglobin, I know there's a good amount of oxygen in here, but this tissue is active. See how high the temperature is? This temperature is showing you that I'm active. Even though there's a fair amount of oxygen left, I'm still active, so give us a little bit more oxygen. And so that's what it is. These four factors can shift this baseline curve. This is the baseline curve, but these other determinants of whether a tissue is active or not active can make this, the, the hemoglobin give off more oxygen or give off less oxygen. Again, I haven't done a pretty job of drawing this curve, but let's, like I said, look at the next slide. Here we see, again, here is that normal curve. This was what was the blue curve on the last slide. But notice in the case of there being more carbon dioxide, that's usually an indication of more metabolic activity, our curve shifts down, or like it said, it looks like it's shifting to the right. Meaning that in that with more carbon dioxide, the hemoglobin gives off more oxygen. When there's less carbon dioxide in the environment, then it gives off less oxygen. So notice here is the partial pressure uh, 10, 20, 30. So here is 30 partial pressure of oxygen. Normally, it would give off, you know, a little over, a little under half of its oxygen. This would be the normal case. However, if there's more CO2, it's going to give off more oxygen. If there's less CO2, it's going to give off less oxygen. And so basically, these other characteristics like carbon dioxide uh, pH, which does the same thing, dropping the pH or increasing the pH. Again, carbon dioxide affects pH, but other things like lactic acid and other do things as well. And that pH effect is called the Bohr's because good old Bob Bohr is the first one who described it. You don't need to know that term. Temperature. Here's your normal temperature. If temperature increases, we want to give off more oxygen. As temperature decreases, we want to give off less. If you think about it, this is one of the big problems that we get with frostbite. As we talked about in 430, when your body is cold, your blood vessels constrict, bringing less blood to the environment. So you have less perfusion of blood going to your periphery, like your fingers, like your toes, uh, you know, because we want to keep that heat at the core of our body. 
The problem is then the temperature of my finger drops. Now the temperature of my finger drops, I'm not able to get a lot of blood to it. And notice the blood that does come to my fingers isn't gonna wanna give off any oxygen. So there may be a little bit of blood going to my fingers, but the blood that's going there doesn't wanna give off any oxygen. So now the tissues at my fingers are cold and not getting the oxygen that they're going to need. So what ends up happening to the tips of my fingers or the tips of my nose or my ears as a result of being exposed to that cold for a prolonged period of time? They fall off. Yeah, they get frostbitten, they, get, they freeze and they can be damaged, yeah, absolutely. You get that damage from the, from the, the, the cold. Because not only does it get cold and not getting uh, a lot of nutrients, it's not getting rid of waste, it's getting very cold, but it's also not getting the oxygen that it needs either. So the key point is these factors, things like carbon dioxide, things like the pH, things like the temperature are other things that can show how active a tissue is. And so we can shift our curve either right or down to give more oxygen, either left or up to give less oxygen, depending on them. And like I said, there are four characteristics. There is uh, um, carbon dioxide partial pressure, the pH of the blood, the temperature of the blood, and the fourth thing was metabolic wastes. There are a lot of metabolic wastes, but one of the ones that the hemoglobin is most sensitive to happens to be a metabolic waste of the red blood cells. And that metabolic waste of the red blood cells is biphosphoglycerate. Now this will be one of the rare instances where you don't have to memorize this term. You can just use the abbreviation BPG or you can just use the term metabolic waste. So I have no problem with you just saying metabolic wastes are one of the factors that that included but i did want to mention biphosphoglycerate because it is a metabolic waste of the red blood cell so the more of this metabolic waste there is the more active the tissue is the more oxygen it is going to give off all right questions on that I think this is probably the most confusing thing we're gonna to have to deal with in this section. If for some reason, this is something that people get caught up on all the time. But if you really focus on understanding what the primary characteristics are, the partial pressure of oxygen and how much oxygen binds to the hemoglobin, that's that standard curve, that is the primary factor. And then again, we wanna fine tune things. We can have other indicators of how active a tissue is, and these other factors will want either, if we're more active, we want to give more oxygen, less active, we want to give less oxygen. And that's really the key, right? More active tissue uh, wants more oxygen. Less active tissue wants less oxygen. And that's it we can shift the curve so that we can meet the needs of the tissue. If it's more active, we shift it down, or again to the right is what it looks like. You're really shifting down, but it looks like it's shifted to the right, so we can give it more oxygen. When the tissue is less active, we shift it up, or it looks like it shifts to the left, so we give it less oxygen. And so if you focus on those key concepts, hopefully this won't be too intimidating. All right. Questions on that? Excellent. There you go. We did that. Oh, and then of course, the carbon monoxide. If you had carbon monoxide poisoning, what would happen to this curve then? Not okay. wanna not gonna want to give off its oxygen. Well, but how much? Think of it this way: How much oxygen is going to be able to bind to our hemoglobin if carbon monoxide is present? None. None. Yeah. So our line is basically going to be down here like that. That's not a very big line, but you get the idea here. Make a more messy line, right? Basically, it's down there like this. We're not going to be able to bind any oxygen to it at all. So basically, it flatlines, and that's the problem because now it doesn't have any oxygen to give when it gets to the tissues. All righty. Here's the picture that I promised you. 
summing all of this up. Notice here is our internal gas exchange between our tissues and the interstitial fluid and our blood. Notice as we talked about, most of the oxygen, 98.5% of the oxygen that is carried by our uh, blood is carried by our red blood cells. So when we get to that low oxygen pressure, partial pressure environment, oxygen is released and diffuses to the tissues. Remember, there is that 1.5% uh, that is dissolved in the plasma, and of course it will move down its concentration gradient as well, but it's not providing the oxygen that we're getting here from the uh, hemoglobin. Here we are loading up the carbon uh, monoxide, uh, carbon, pardon me, carbon dioxide. Again, some of it dissolves straight into the plasma. Some of it binds to our hemoglobin. But the majority of it is being converted into bicarbonate. Now, notice, as we talked about, uh, bicarbonate uh, production has an enzyme, that carbonic anhydrase, that is located inside of our red blood cells, which makes that process occur more rapidly. But not every chemical reaction has to have an enzyme. So a little bit will do it without the enzyme. But the majority of our carbon dioxide is converted by that enzyme into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So we have that there that is occurring in our internal gas exchange. And then here we have our external gas exchange. Oxygen coming out of the alveoli, the majority of it, 98.5%, is loading onto our red blood cells. Oxygen is some tiny bit, 1.5% is dissolving into the plasma. Again, now with the low levels of carbon uh, dioxide, our equation goes in the opposite direction. Again, sometimes most of it is facilitated by our enzyme, but some can move down without the enzyme, but the majority uses the enzyme. And we get that uh, production of carbon dioxide, which then diffuses into the lungs. And again, we lose some of it dissolved in the plasma as well. So here is the pretty picture that shows that uh, diffusion and gas transport that we talked about. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. The last thing oops, that we need to talk about then for today is our control of the respiration. There are basically three respiratory centers that control our respiration. And when we control respiration, we mean both the rate, how many breaths you take per minute, and the uh, depth, whether you're taking shallow breaths or deep breaths. So we wanna control the depth and we wanna control the rate. The first of these are in the medulla. Here in the medulla, we have our dorsal respiratory group and our ventral respiratory group. And in our pons, we have the respiratory centers as well. So we have respiratory centers in the pons. We also have two respiratory centers, the dorsal and ventral respiratory groups in our um, medulla. So those are the three areas where we control respiration. Let's talk about the um, dorsal respiratory group first. The dorsal respiratory group uh, integrates many peripheral input. It gets information from our internal environment, from our external environment, a whole bunch of information. And its job is to take that information and send it to our ventral respiratory group. So our dorsal respiratory group in the medulla is our fine tuner, right? This is what fine tunes our respiratory rate. What actually determines our respiratory rate is the ventral respiratory group. The ventral respiratory group has two important nuclei. Remember, nuclei is a cluster of cell bodies. They are the inspiratory uh, center and the expiratory center. And hopefully, but based on the names, it shouldn't be a surprise, the inspiratory center is what is responsible for inspiration or inhalation. 
The expiratory center is what is responsible for expiration. These two respiratory centers have a very interesting relationship to each other. Basically, they have what we call a reciprocal inhibition. Reciprocal inhibition means that they inhibit each other. This is the part, like I said, that is a little bit tricky. This is the second tricky part that we have to cover. And I think for this, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to switch to the whiteboard and see if I can um, make some really basic sense of how this works. So we need to clear the old information uh, that was there before. So uh, with my drawing, let's do this. There's one, there's two. This is my inspiratory. Center. And this is the sorry, oops. Center. Oops, that's not. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, inspiratory center's job is to cause inspiration. This is going to cause the inhalation. And remind me again, with inhalation, is inhalation active or passive? It's active. Active. Excellent. Which again means it uses ATP. And of course it uses ATP to contract muscles. And if it's your normal tidal resting breath, what muscle is it contracting? Diaphragm. There you go. It is contracting the diaphragm. So its job is to excite the inhalation muscles. And so if you think of it this way, when this, uh, let's actually put this over here, and then I can do this here. When it fires action potentials, it excites the diaphragm, the diaphragm contracts, and we inhale. So far, so good? Yep. Excellent. However, as I mentioned, this inspiratory center and expiratory center have what we call a reciprocal inhibition. This basically includes two things. Basically, as the name would indicate, they inhibit each other. And if you remember, oops, bit each other. And again, if we want to be more specific about what that means, means it means it um, decreases the resting membrane potential. Right? It makes it less likely to fire an action potential. Right? Some of that sounds vaguely familiar from when we were taking 430. Vaguely. Vaguely. Excellent. We're going to make it less likely to fire an action potential. Uh, but the second key component to this is that the cells habituate and rebound. What this means, if you remember what it means to habituate, habituate means to basically lose sensitivity to. Right? So, for instance, when you have that newborn baby, that newborn baby whimpers just the tiniest bit on the other side of the house, and you're instantly aware of it, and you're running over there to see if everything is okay. If you have teenagers like me, 
They could be downstairs screaming and yelling your name, crying, all sorts of wailing, crashing going on, and you are not paying any attention to it every, at all. You are completely unaware of it going on, right? Even if it was right next door, you lose that sensitivity. You no longer have sensitivity to it. So we lose that sensitivity. That's what it means to habituate. And what it means to rebound is when you lose that sensitivity uh, to the cell, what happens is you depolarize as a result. I know this may not make a lot of sense as we describe it, but let's see it in process and see if we can see how this would work. All right, so step one. Uh, our inspiratory center fires action potentials. Obviously when it fires action potentials, it excites our diaphragm so that our diaphragm contracts and we breathe in. But this firing of the inspiratory center does something else. As we mentioned, aside from not only causing the diaphragm to contract, what it is also going to do is it inhibits the expiratory center. And if our expiratory center is inhibited, then the effect of that is our expiratory center fires no action potentials. Hopefully that's pretty simple and straightforward. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? All right, so here's the fun part. This is how it starts. Inspiratory center fires its action potentials, causes the diaphragm to contract. You get an inhalation as a result of that, but you don't inhale forever. Eventually you stop inhaling. That muscle stops contracting. And the reason for that is because of this second component to our inspiratory, oops, no, no. Leave that there. Change the color here. After a while, what happens is our expiratory center habituates to the inspiratory center. When this happens, it stops being inhibited. And what happens is it actually starts to fire action potentials. So after a while, our expiratory center habituates to the uh, inspiratory center. This inhibition no longer has an effect, All right? So it no longer has that effect. And so basically what happens is it rebounds and it starts to fire action potentials. This is significant because our inspiratory center, when it fires action potentials, it inhibits the inspiratory center. And if our inspiratory center is inhibited, no new action potentials are produced. And with no new action potentials, we stop exciting the diaphragm. And when we stop exciting the diaphragm, the muscles relax. And when the muscles relax, we exhale. Thanks to the recoil, our exhalation occurs. All right. Questions on that? Excellent. Now, so we breathed in. This inhibited, started firing action potential, stopping this, we breathed out. Of course, we do need to eventually breathe back in again. And luckily for us, 
the reason that occurs is because here in, I guess this over here was step two, after a time, our inspiratory center habituates to the expiratory center. Of course, when that occurs, it starts firing actual potentials. And the process begins again. All right, it is going to now inhibit uh, the expiratory center. It is now going to stimulate the muscles and our contraction and our inhalation begins again. So notice the whole point of this reciprocal inhibition is basically these two cells get to take turns firing. First, this cell fires, the expiratory center cells fire, and that causes the muscle to contract. Then the expiratory center fires, and that causes the muscles to relax. And then this one fires and they contract, and then this one fires and they relax. So basically, all this is is a fairly simple, basically uh, alternating circuit. That's all this is. It's just an alternating circuit. That's what this reciprocal inhibition does. It allows these to take turns contracting, and as they take uh, pardon me, firing action potentials, and as they take turns firing action potentials, the muscles contract and the muscles relax and we produce our normal rate of breathing. As it turns out, that normal rate of breathing is what we call our eupnea, and it involves about a two second inhalation followed by a three second exhalation. The inhalation, if you think about it, is active using ATP, so it's not surprising it's a little faster than our than our passive recoil of the lungs, recoil of the muscles and ligaments for the exhalation. And of course, an entire uh, respiratory cycle takes five seconds with 60 seconds in a minute. Our normal resting breathing rate is about 12 breaths per minute. So again, believe it or not, that is the simplistic explanation of how you produce your normal breathing pattern, or what we call our eupnea. All right, questions on that? Can you go back to your illustration real quick, please? I can. Thanks. So again, the only other thing that I would say, just to make sure uh, there's no confusion, is this here was step two. All right, that habituation, and then over here. Was step three, or really step one again. So there you go. So it's really a kind of a two-step, or if you want to think of it, a three-step process where we have this bouncing back and forth. And again, the real important take-home message is that these two centers alternate in their firing rates to produce the rate at which our muscles contract and relax, the diaphragm primarily contracts and relaxes, to produce that normal breathing rate. All righty. Any other questions? Alex, did you have a question as well? Or just as that raised hand from before? Not from earlier. Okay, let me go ahead and clear that then. All righty. Anybody other questions on this? Now, this is your normal breathing rate while you're sitting here 
uh, calmly in our quote unquote classroom learning this material. But as we mentioned, we want to be able to modify and affect that. So part of that modifying and affecting is going to be from our dorsal, where's my annotation, there it is. Again, this dorsal respiratory group is going to be looking at what your oxygen levels in your blood are, your CO2 levels in the blood, the pH in the blood, all of those types of things. But we also have our pontine group, which is getting this as well. Your pontine group also receives stimulus from inside and outside of the body. But one of the keys to your pontine group is your pontine group is where you have the ability to have a cognitive effect. So for instance, obviously, if I'm producing speech and I'm forcing air out of my lungs, I'm not using the normal breathing pattern, right? Uh, your breathing pattern changes when you sleep, right? You're laying there in bed next to your loved one, waiting for that change in the breathing pattern to know that they're asleep so you can jump out of bed and go play on the Xbox, right? When you exercise, you get up and run around the room 15 times, your respiration rate changes or volition, control. You can decide if you want to take three big deep breaths. That cognitive control comes from our pontine respiratory group, right? The other one on this, obviously some of it is conscious, but it's also unconscious. When you're aroused, when you're depressed, when you're sad, when you're angry, that limbic system, our emotional effect of our respiration is there as well. All of that comes through this pontine group. So we have this again, ability to modify it consciously or subconsciously based on what's going on in our heads. All right. Now, all of these respiratory groups are sensitive to sensory stimuli. And the three primary factors are carbon dioxide level, pH, and oxygen level. So if we take each one of these separately, let's start first with oxygen. All right. Um, and let's do it this way. Decrease. And increase. So if we have an increase, a decrease in oxygen levels, what do you think is gonna happen to the depth and rate of our inspiration is it going to go up or go down. We're we going to want to take bigger, more breaths, rate go up, depth go up. If oxygen levels drop, do we need more air or less air? More. More. More, more. absolutely. Increase so and increase. Decrease in oxygen levels, then we're going to need more air. And as a result of needing more air, we are going to take bigger breaths and more breaths. So we have, uh, so we want to move more air. And, and so again, our uh, depth increases, uh, it goes up, let's say it this way. Uh, both the depth of it and the rate goes up. And of course, if oxygen levels are high, then our levels, uh, our rate of breathing and our depth of breathing is going, breathing is going to go down. Oops. What about CO2 levels? If CO2 levels decrease, what's going to happen to our rate and depth of inspiration? Go down. Decrease. Yeah. There you go. And then, of course, if our CO2 levels go up, that's an indication that we are more metabolically active, we are going to breathe deeper, and we are going to breathe more often. And, of course, again, related to that is pH. If pH uh, decreases, again, that means more acidic. So our rate and depth increase. goes up and of course if it decreases then the rate and depth goes down again i think these are fairly intuitive right if we think about it having less oxygen having uh, more co2 
having the blood be more acidic, have it go down. All of these cases are indications of higher metabolic activity. So our rate of breathing goes up, our depth of breathing goes up. We take bigger breaths and we take them more frequently. All three of these factors have the ability to influence our rate and depth of inspiration, but all three are not equally important. Anybody know which of these three factors is the most important? Carbon dioxide. Absolutely, carbon dioxide. I will tell you that right now, that is absolutely positively the truth. However, hopefully in today's lab, you will get an opportunity to actually play with that and see how that works. All right, and see if that is indeed true. But absolutely, it is carbon dioxide that has the biggest effect. So again, carbon dioxide is the most important and they're all measured. Uh, and of course, we need to know what the pH of our blood is. We need to know what our uh, oxygen level and our CO2 levels are. So of course, we are going to have uh, central and peripheral chemoreceptors. And I think I have a picture of it. Yeah, perfect. So I won't bother writing it out. These central and peripheral chemoreceptors are located two primary areas. If you remember up here, where our common carotid branches to the internal and external carotids, right at that location, at that crux, are the carotid bodies. These carotid bodies are chemo and uh, osmoreceptors, measuring the condition of the blood as it goes to the brain. Measuring the condition of the blood going systemically are our aortic, aortic bodies. So in both of these locations, we have chemo and osmoreceptors that take this information and send it to the pons, send it to the medulla so that we can control uh, respiration. And here's the pretty picture that kind of shows how that works. Partial pressure of CO2 goes up, right? We have those chemoreceptors and peripheral receptors that measure that. They send the signal to the medulla. The medulla then increases the rate and depth. So we breathe more rapidly, we take deeper breaths, we get rid of that CO2, and we bring it back down. Again, here's the other nice flow chart that shows that. And again, these are on the slides. We just finished talking about all of this. Um, uh, and I have one more picture at the end. But as we said, there are, those are the three primary, but there are other factors that can affect the rate and depth of breathing blood pressure measured by baroreceptors. The volume changes in your lung. This is a great uh, characteristic. Uh, when I tell you to take a huge inhalation and fill your lungs to their maximum, are you actually filling your lungs to the maximum? No. Nope. No, it turns out you're not. Uh, if I were to take like a pressure hose or something like that, I could get more air in there if you wanted. However, your lungs are set up to protect themselves. Because if you think about a balloon, when you blow up a balloon, you typically don't get the maximal amount of air you can into that balloon. Because if you get to the maximal amount and go a little bit over, what happens? Pops. Yeah, the balloon pops, absolutely. And we don't want to pop our lungs. So our lungs have a really cool protective mechanism. As we, our lungs fill up with air and they stretch, Ooh, is my whiteboard still there? Awesome. So, as our lungs stretch, the lungs have a stretch receptor, and that stretch receptor basically produces action potentials. Uh, the more it stretches. So, uh, so let's say it this way. Stretch receptors and the more it stretches, uh, the more that it produces action potentials. These action potentials are sent to the inspiratory center. And these action potentials of the inspiratory center inhibit the inspiratory center. So if you think about it, the more the lungs stretch, the bigger signal they send to the inspiratory center to stop it from firing. And if it stops firing, we stop contracting the muscle and you stop inhaling the lung on the lungs. 
So in this fashion, our lungs protect themselves. They don't let you fill it up to the maximum. They actually stop that. This is what is known as the herring Brewer reflex. Uh, herring and Brewer were two anatomists who both discovered this, or physiologists who both discovered this at a similar time, both wrote papers on it. Huge debate over who uh, gets credit. So as you can see, they both got their name on it, which is typically how these types of things were resolved. But that is that inflation or herring Brewer reflex. Uh, obviously, there are other things that can disrupt the normal rate of breathing. If you inhale a little bit of pepper or some type of other type of chemical or a physical irritant, it can cause that coughing, that hacking, that can constrict the airways. We can have problems that way. Other physical sensations as well. Pain affects our rate and depth of breathing. Temperature, right? That's one of the main problems with those polar bear plunges. Right back in ancient times, at the beginning of at the winter solstice, like in Chicago, is one of the great places. Everybody would go out and jump into the Chicago River. The problem with that is when your temperature changes, drops really dramatically, that can suppress respiration. So not only can it stop your heart, like we talked about, but it also can dramatically decrease your rate of respiration. We already talked about how your limbic system, uh, emotions, anger, confusion right, uh, uh, arousal, all of those things can affect, and then like we also talked about volition. You can voluntarily control it. All right, and here's the pretty picture that puts it all together. Higher order stuff, like the limbic system, like our voluntary control, right, chemoreceptors in our hypothalamus, uh, uh, peripheral receptors, central receptors, the stretch receptors, irritants, right, uh, condition of the muscles and all that temperature, all those types of things come in and affect the rate and depth of our breathing. All right. Now, lastly, oh, here we go. Uh, as I mentioned, your normal adult rate of respiration is about 12 to 15 breaths per minute. But obviously that changes during the course of our life. That newborn baby has an incredibly mutantly fast rate of respiration. And of course, why do they have such a high rate of respiration? Small lungs. Yeah. Absolutely. One of it is definitely their lungs are much, much smaller, so they have less surface area. But also remember, they're also way metabolically more active than we are. They have a massive metabolism and very small lungs. That is not a good combination, and so they have to breathe really fast to get all the oxygen that they need. However, as we get bigger and as our metabolism decreases, our rates decrease until we become adults. However, as we also talked about, as we continue to get older, respiration rates typically go up, right? As we talked about, as you produce less surficant, your surface area goes down, right? Working in that coal mine, of smoking those two packs of cigarettes that you did for 40 years, all of those things can decrease the amount of alveoli that are functional, decreasing your surface area. And we start to lose elasticity in our lungs in our rib cage and our, you know, and all of those muscles, ligaments, things along those lines. So each breath becomes less efficient. So once again, the respiration rate tends to increase. All right, excellent. That is everything we need to know from a lecture standpoint for the respiratory system. Any questions on that? All right, excellent. What that leaves us with then is today's lab. As I mentioned, uh, this is a lab we would normally do in class, uh, but I think this is a great opportunity for this to be something that you guys can do at home. So what we're going to do, and let me go ahead and share the screen again by going into our course module. Excellent, this is where we want to be right here. When you go, you know, start at our homepage. When you go into your homepage, you are going to go into the modules. And in the modules, uh, here are the study tools that I mentioned, uh, the CRC, uh, the COVID-19 lung story. Those are links that you can click on. Um, also, uh, during the break today, I'm going to put uh, a direct link to the YouTube, because I know some people, I keep getting uh, emails from people who are having trouble finding the recorded lecture. So I'll go ahead and put the YouTube link in here. So I will do that as well. Uh, but what we're gonna want to do right now is come down to section three. 
you're in section three, our respiratory and urinary system, I have added two new things. I have added a uh, assignment to it, where when you complete this activity, you can submit the assignment. But the other thing that I have added down here under the lab handouts is a control of respiration home lab. This control of respiration home lab, and we'll go ahead and click on that to open it up, are two activities that you can participate in at home. Now, just like if we were doing this in the classroom, there are rules. So there are rules that you must follow when you are doing this. First and most importantly, if you have any type of respiratory condition, or if you have any, or if you're sick, do not participate in these activities, okay? Secondly, do not do this by yourself. If you are social distancing and live by yourself and it's just you alone, then like I said, just write these out as a, um, as a thought experiment of what you think might happen, but you should always have somebody that you're monitoring or better yet, make somebody else in the house to do it and you can monitor them while they do it. Next rule, when, and again, these are all written here. Uh, as it says also, while you're doing these breathing activities, stay seated. You do not want to do this while you're standing uh, because if someone gets lightheaded and uh, starts to pass out, you do not want them to fall and hit themselves and hurt themselves. So when you're doing all of the breathing activities, you are going to do them in a seated position and someone is going to be observing you to make sure that you don't get dizzy, don't get lightheaded, don't pass out. All right. The other reason you want to have somebody else there, aside from the safety issue, is because you want to have one person who's doing the activities and you want to have another person who's doing the recordings. Basically, one of the things you're going to be doing is you're going to be timing these activities. Uh, one of the first activity, as we'll see here, is holding your breath. And what I found is if, that you, if you are watching the clock while you're holding your breath, it can affect your uh, the outcome. So it is better while you're holding your breath that you not see the clock, that you not see the counter. So have somebody else timing you with their stopwatch or with a stopwatch on your phone or using a clock or with a seconds hand or whatever it is, but do not watch the clock. If you watch the clock, it can affect your uh, results. All right. So as we work our way down, again, all the safety things being observed, everything else, follow the directions. But here is the short version of what's going to be happening. For this first activity, you are going to be holding your breath to see how long you can hold your breath for. The first thing you're going to do is, again, while you're sitting there breathing normally, breathing normally, you are then going to take a maximal inhalation and you're going to hold your breath for as long as you can hold your breath. Have someone else count it and then you're going to write that time down here on the chart. Fully recover from that wait a good couple minutes, and then when you're feeling normal and comfortable again, do it a second time, recover fully from that, do it a third time, all right? Recover in between each of them, breathe normally in between each of them, make sure you're seated when you do these activities. Once you do that, you'll take the average and write the average down here for this. Our real question, and I'm gonna cheat and go back to the whiteboard, Go ahead and clear this. The real question that we are asking here is what determines how long we can hold our breath? Right? That is really the question that we are asking. And really, there are two main possibilities oxygen and carbon dioxide. There we go. Those are our two main possibilities. So what you are going to do in the activity is you are going to uh, hold breath and you're going to do it at rest. Then what you are going to do 
is you are going to get up because this is important to do when we're all uh, locked inside and social distancing. You are going to exercise for two to three minutes. You want to build up a sweat. You want your heart rate to change to where you can feel, physically feel the change in your heart rate. And then what you're going to do is sit back down. And once you sit back down, you're going immediately, immediately go sit down after your exercise and try to hold your breath and see how long you can do it for. Then you're going to give yourself a full five or 10 minutes. Go 10 minutes because, again, we're not going to have the rush of time. Recover completely. Heck, do it the next day if you want. You can spread this over time because it's not due till Monday. And then what you are going to do is you are going to hyperventilate yourself. Again, this is why you want to have someone observing you while you're doing this. These are also why you don't want the exercise and the hyperventilate is why if you have any type of respiratory disorder or, or if you're sick at all, you do not want to be participating in this. But basically what you are going to do is take big, deep, rapid breaths. And you're going to do that till you, for a couple minutes or until you start feeling lightheaded. When you start feeling lightheaded uh, from that hyperventilation, then take a big inhalation and hold your breath. So basically, we're going to be looking uh, at holding our breath under three different conditions. The reason this will tell us something has to do with the oxygen and carbon dioxide. As we learned with oxygen, we saw that our oxygen in our blood saturates very, very rapidly. So obviously at rest, we have saturated uh, oxygen in our blood. However, when we exercise, if our heart rate doubles from what it is at rest, we are still able to fully oxygenate our blood during that time. And when we hyperventilate, we may get more oxygen into our blood, but if our hemoglobin already has four oxygen bound to it, can we really get any more bound to it? No. So notice in all three of these conditions, the amount of oxygen in our blood does not change. What that means is if oxygen is what determines how long we can hold our breath, it shouldn't matter whether we hyperventilated, it shouldn't matter whether we exercised, it shouldn't matter whether we're at rest, we should be able to hold our breath for the exact same amount of time. I agree. All right. Carbon dioxide, however, does change. When, right, so at rest, obviously, it's the normal level. When we exercise, we get an increase in the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the blood. And when we hyperventilate, while we don't dramatically change how much oxygen is in the blood, what we do, what we are able to do with that hyperventilation is we can dramatically decrease the amount of carbon dioxide that is available in the blood. So if carbon dioxide is what determines how long we can hold our breath, then when we exercise and there's more carbon dioxide, we should be able to hold our breath for less time because what takes us more time, uh, less time to get to that critical point. Whereas if we hyperventilate it, we should be able to hold our breath for more. Now, again, if we just do this as a thought experiment, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that you can hold your breath for the exact same amount of time in all of these three conditions? Or do you think they're going to change in all three of these conditions? It'll change. It's going to change. So we should, we kind of have an understanding of what the answer should be, but let's actually put it to the test. That's going to be the goal of this activity, is actually to put that to the test. What we think should happen, see if that does indeed happen. So like I said, if you have someone you can observe, do it, or can observe you while you're doing it, and you can do it safely, then feel free to do the activity. If not, then do it like the thought experiment we just did. We expect, based on our understanding, our hypothesis 
is that after exercising, we'll hold it for less. After hyperventilating, we'll be able to do it for more. And based on those answers, explain why that is the case. So I'd like you to be able to do it. It's a fun activity to do as long as you can do it safely. Otherwise, just answer this question, explaining those results based on the thought experiment and what we expected to happen. Now, here's the second part. Here is the fun part. We are going to talk about that mystical, magical process that we talked about, about carbon dioxide. That mystical, magical process about carbon dioxide, that carbon dioxide, when you add it to water, equals an acid. Again, if you have the opportunity to do this, if you have the things in your, in your house and are willing to use them for this, then I think this is a fun activity for you to participate. But if not, it is okay if you're not able to do it. What you're going to do is you're gonna make a pH indicator. The easiest way to do this is using some type of plant material that has anthocyanins in it. These are basically things that are dark purplish in color, uh, like red cabbage, blueberries, blackberries, or if you have a, a, you know, a, a, a jug of purple grape juice or purple grapes around, you can use those things as well. Purple gra grape, I'm gonna try that again. Purple grape juice works perfectly by itself. So all you would need is two cups of that. You don't have to do any more work. Just get two cups of purple grape juice. It's gotta be purple. But if it's purple grape juice and it's 100% grape juice, it's not purple artificially, uh, then, because uh, artificial won't work. But if it's natural purple grape juice, then that'll work. If you have something like red cabbage or blueberries or blackberries or something like that, and you're inclined, you can make your own pH indicator. Basically what you do is you cut up the cabbage into small one uh, inch chunks, or you smash the berries and grapes, put them in a temperature safe bowl, and a color safe bowl, because this stuff will stain, so you do want to be careful with that. To that, add two cups of boiling water. Let it soak in there for 15 minutes, and what'll happen is the color will seep out of the plant material. You then want to strain it, get all of the plant material out uh, into a, a container, and what you should have at the end of that is two cups of a purple bluish um, liquid. And that is your pH indicator. Now, this stuff can stain your counters, your skin, your clothing. So be careful making it. Be careful with dishes. If you've got these beautiful, white, porous bone china, do not use those because it'll stain them. All right. So again, think about these things when you're doing it. But if you can make it, what you want is two cups of a pH indicator. What you are then going to do is take half of it and pour half of it into a tall, clear glass. You are then going to put a straw into that glass and you are going to put a napkin or a paper towel over the top because you don't want it to splash out. And the reason it might splash out is what you are going to do is you are going to exhale into that solution using the straw. I know it's awkward breathing through the straw, but try to do this as naturally as possible. What you're going to do and time yourself doing this is breathe in through your nose and breathe out the straw. Do not breathe in the straw. You will drink the liquid. Again, it's not going to kill you, but don't do it. You'll cough on it. So breathe in the nose and out the straw. Try to keep your breathing rate as normal as possible. The goal isn't to go as fast as possible. The goal is to go as normally as possible. When you breathe air out into that solution, you're going to be breathing out CO2. And that CO2 is going to mix with the water in your pH indicator, and it's going to make it acidic. As it turns more acidic, your pH indicator will go from bluish and purplish to more pinkish and reddish. The goal is to get it as red as you can. Try to get rid of as much of the purple and blue as possible. Try to get to whatever a, a color is, but whatever color it is, stop at that color, decide what your color is gonna be. Try to get it as much pink, as much red, and time yourself for how long you're gonna do that. And you're gonna do that while you're at rest. Once you do that, pour out that solution, or better yet, if you can save that solution and you have a second glass, pour your other half of your solution into the second glass, and that way you can compare the two to make sure you get it the right color. Then what you are going to do is you are going to exercise for two to three minutes. 
Again, you want to feel your heart rate increase. You want to feel your respiration rate increasing. You want to exercise vigorously enough that you feel the physiological change. Then you're going to sit down, doing these things sitting down. Again, breathe as normally as you can. Again, especially if you've just finished exercising. It is really hard to breathe at a normal rate through a straw. But try to breathe as normally as you can, the same rate that you did the first time, uh, through the straw into the glass and change the color of the liquid again. Again, what this does is this tests our previous hypothesis. Our previous hypothesis is that we could hold our breath for less time when we exercised because we had more CO2. Well, this will prove whether that's true. If we, when we exercised, we have more CO2. Because if you exercise and you have more CO2, then when you breathe out, you should be producing more CO2 and you should be able to change the color of your solution faster. So that's what you're going to do. Breathe twice into it. If we scroll down, oops, hold on. Uh, actually, it's on the next page. So on the next page here, you can see how much time did it take to change while you rest, how much time did it take with your exercise. And then there are a couple places where you explain why it changed, explain the results of the experiments, and confirm these hypotheses that we talked about. Again, do them if it's safe, do them if you have the materials, do them if you're healthy. If not, then just answer these questions as a thought experiment. You are welcome to work together. If you guys want to set up your own Zoom classrooms or use the discussion board, I don't know, I haven't even looked to see if you guys are using the discussion board. You want to work together on these things that are fine. But again, observing someone over the computer, over the camera, is not the same as being there to help them if they pass out. So only do this if you have somebody else in the household with you. But I think this is a fun way to get some hands-on respiratory experience. So if you have the tools, if you have the materials, and again, for the first half, you just have to have somebody be healthy, or at least have them be healthy, and have a timer of some time uh, to do that. So the first, most people should be able to do the first activity. But hopefully, at least some of you can try the second activity. And if you do the second activity, I think we would all love to see pictures of your pH indicators, uh, if you could do that for us and share that with us as well. So this is a lab you've got between now and Monday. All this, along with the reviews, along with the Physio X, is all due at the beginning of the class on Monday. All right, so questions on any of that? So that is your assignment. That is everything we need to know from a lecture standpoint for the, um, from a lecture standpoint for the respiratory system. And now we have all of the assignments you need to do for the respiratory system to make sure you've mastered this. All right, excellent. So that stuff is there for you there. And that is all I have for you today. I know it feels like we went late because it's noon, but remember we started at eight. So we are still, till, still technically within our class time. This is a longer lecture though, so it will take longer to convert and longer to upload to, um, to, uh, to uh, YouTube, but uh, it will definitely be on there today. If it's not here by this, it's not on there by this evening, then let me know that probably means that there was something that was wrong. All right, any other questions? <laughs> Just one question: Can we um, can we submit our our assignments prior to the due date? Absolutely, yes. Those are just okay. it, it's always this. That's always the case with those assignments. Uh, well, I guess it's not with the unit reviews because normally I don't want them ahead of time. But yes, absolutely. Uh, when you've got them done, go ahead and and put and input them. Yes, absolutely. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? All right, then you guys are tasked with what it is that you need to do. I'll hang out here for a few minutes in case there's any more questions or any other concerns or things along those lines. Uh, but then once uh, everybody disappears, I will uh, start converting the uh, videos and get them put up. Like I said, I'll add the YouTube link to, uh, to, our, uh, to our Canvas uh, modules under the study tools to help you to be successful. Uh, but you have those other things. So uh, good luck and have fun. Enjoy your weekend. Study and work hard. And then hopefully, when Monday, hopefully when we come back, because it'll be a week before spring break, hopefully we'll have a better idea of what our situation is as to whether we're coming back to the classroom or whether this is going on prolonged. So we'll see what happens. Uh, the, all the medical people keep telling us that uh, it's going to be longer. 
Uh, but our president wants everything up and running by Easter, so uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see who wins. All right, otherwise, have a good day. I am going to go ahead and stop the recording now, uh, but uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask them.